And we are live with our pre-show of today's 2201101 Core 1A Plus Study Group. Let's see if I can get my screen working the way I would expect it to work. Let's see if it it doesn't. <laughs> there we go. Now it works. It's all about holding your mouth just right. And then everything works fine. Hi, everybody. Hey, chat room. Let's pop out the chat. Pop out the chat. Pop out the chat. There we go. Hey, chat room. Good to see you. Let's move this over here. Let's change some things on the screen. We've already done our info for the podcast intro. We've already done all that. We are recording. Looks good. Hey, chat room. How's everybody doing? We are indeed uh, doing this. Let's see if I can. There we go. So now you can kind of get things ready to go. There's Malk. How you doing? I noticed that uh, the storm has made a curve up to the northward. So we are both in good shape here for the next couple of weeks, aren't we? A lot going on here. We got we got lots happening here. When, when the camera's not on, there's lots going on. We got We got things happening right now. We're ramping up. That's always good when there's so much happening that you almost can't take a breath. It makes the day go by quickly for sure. Got a lot uh, to go through today. Today is our A-plus study group. So I've got questions for you from the A-plus exam objectives. And in the second hour, I will open up the phone line. Well, not the phone lines, but the chat lines. We'll open up the chat lines. We have not really the chat, but I'll show you how on VVox you can post a question. In fact, you can do it right now in your VVox. There's an extra tab there. You can tab over and leave questions there too. And then I'll see them. Well, I can't see them on this screen, but I'll be able to see them pop up on my console here. Uh, so we got plenty of stuff to go through. This is going to be good. Everybody checking in. Thanks for being here, everyone. There's uh, folks in uh, Colorado Springs and Sweden and Pakistan and Okinawa. I haven't been to Okinawa in a while. Um, got lots going on. Sarasota, there's Florida folks checking in. I think we dodged one, didn't we, Sarasota? I don't know how it was for you, but I well, you were on the bad side of the storm. I was on the good side of the storm. So that's what that was about. We got, uh, so it was hardly anything going on here. There was a few outages uh, of power uh, around the area. I was not part of that, thankfully, um, for a change. Wait till the next one. It'll it'll get me. It'll, it'll bring everything down. Ireland is here. Canada is here. Columbus, Ohio is here. Nigeria, South Africa is here. Folks checking in from all over the world. Thanks for being here. We've got lots to do today. All new questions, of course. We'll, we'll figure out the details. Those of you wondering what, what you do with VVox, what's up with that? There's your codes and the information you can use to answer the questions today. Uh, join at vvox.app. The ID today, 113-592-391. That number again, 113-592-391. Get all of those. Oh, we got Virginia checking in. We got uh, South Africa, Spartanburg, South Carolina. We got Port St. Lucie, more Florida checking in. Thanks for being here. Tucson is here. Memphis is here. I know. I've been to Spartanburg, South Carolina many, 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 many times. Nicest people in the world, by the way. There, South Carolina, and interestingly enough, Puerto Rico. Very nice people. Uh, just, just amazing. There's Miramar. Which Miramar? There's the question. There's lots of Miramars. Uh, we got Nigeria, and Auburn is here. Oh, it's, it's a fun time of the year in Auburn, isn't it? It's, uh, that's always good. Haven't been there in a while. They were. They used to go on campus uh, quite a bit. They were. They were customers of. I would take care of Miramar. So you are in South Florida. I. I am a former. Uh, a, a former. Uh, Miramar. Uh, Miramar address. I. I used to have a home in. Well, I have one in Port in, in Pembroke Pines, and then I moved to Miramar. So not very far. Just like, I don't know what that was about. Well, I moved from a townhouse to uh, like a. A full standing house, like a single family home. It was all in Silver Lakes out there. You know, you know that big mess of houses out there. That's what that's about. Just get off on Miramar Parkway. You go west, you're fine. That's kind of how it works. Five minute warning. We got things going on in five minutes. Lots, lots going on in here. 
Oh, folks are already talking, talking football. It's that time of the season, I guess. I have no idea what's going on with football, but uh, if I did, I would say that, yes, I am also excited about the things that are happening with the football. <laughs> Just am, I am completely closed in in this room right now. There are projects going on upon projects. I really have no time to stick my head out to see what the world is doing. It's still there, right? We still have, uh, we still have a world out there, so we'll figure it out. What are my, what's my best advice for passing the A+, plus? well, attend a live stream. Uh, that's another, that's a good way to do it. And we'll talk about tips and ideas and thoughts. And then especially in the second half of this, in the second hour, we will do Q&A. So if you have specific questions about, here's what I'm thinking of studying, here's how I am planning to study, here's the things I am studying, we can, we can talk about those. We can address them, we can see what's up, and see how things are going. At Ubekistan, Maryland is here. Canada again. Lots of folks in Canada checking in. I'll let I'll let Mrs. Professor Messer know. She always has to know when Canada checks in. Uh, we got Kim folk there. So that's that's one way to do it. Okay. Well, we got uh we got recordings happening. We've got folks that are checking in from all over the world. Uh, a lot going on. Um, it's kind of odd because I come back, I had last week off just because of the timing of things, which worked out okay because of the storm. But then now I'm back in the studio live streaming and now it gets, now it gets challenging to remember what, what do you press? What buttons are, and there's a lot of buttons. So I have to really think about it sometimes. I'll might as well turn that on, get that ready to go. We got three minutes to go till we get started. This is not the live stream. So I've some folks have sent me emails saying, I was gonna tune in, but it was just the back of your head. It was just it was just me looking over your shoulder. No, there's there's an actual study group we're about to do. So that's that's how those things work. We will we will get there in a moment. Do not worry. Wesley Chapel, Florida checking in down near Tampa Way. Thanks for being here. We have um, a lot happening here in Florida right now. There's it's lots of lots of hurricane season is upon us, and there's lots of activity here in the studio right now. We're producing tons of content. In the last couple of weeks, I've probably shot sixty videos, probably more, seventy, I think. Um, we got more to do. There's always something, right? Two minutes, two minutes, Mr. Sinatra. We'll get things going. Hey, Philly. Thanks for being here. And uh, Stephen in the chat room, used your material for the 1101 Core 1, passed my exam last week. Congratulations, Stephen. Great news. Thanks for sharing that. That's always good to hear. Always love getting those stories when people talk about the success they've had with their exams. Thanks so much. There's Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Thanks for being here. I'm going to get into New York uh, at the end of the month, I think I'm going up there for something. There's something going on. I have to go up there for a, for a day or two. I got, I got folks there as well. We got to, got to check in with the fam in New York City. So we got to, we got to do that. Uh, UK is here. Folks are, folks are stumbling in. Find a seat. Make it all happen. See what you can do with this. We will. We'll be getting together and getting everything going here in just a moment. Uh, lots happening. So for those of you that are here for the live stream, thank you for attending. If you're watching on a replay, thank you for also watching on the replay. There's always something going on. Let's see if we can get this sort of set up. I need Keynote. It needs to be a green light. It is a green light. And there's our Keynote. Excellent. It's working a little better than it did last time, though it's a little bright. Turn it down just a little. And then we'll get things started with A+. And then if you have any questions about anything else, stick them in your VBox. It's already, you got a tab there in VBox right now. You can plug in any questions you might have, and we can do that. I'm noticing here that uh, my time is wrong on my, on my mixer. I need to fix that. We'll figure it out. There's, I think it's actually a routing problem. We'll have to discuss that in the, in the Network Plus study group next week. That I think I have a routing issue from the subnet where the mixer is, because the mixer is on its own subnet, then the rest of the network, 
and they replaced my cable modem router. And uh, as it turns out, no longer does static routing. Called them up. I said, hey, it's not static routing. Even though there's a prompt there for static routing, they said, yeah, yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> okay. That's why NTP is not NTPing. That's why I can't. It's sending the NTP, but it's never getting out. It's never getting back. So that's it. I did not build my own router. It's, it's a long story, and we can talk about it if you'd like. In the meantime, though, it's time for a live stream. Let me see if I can get things ready to go, and let's make this happen. Here we go, everybody. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the September 2023 Professor Messer 2201101. Hey, what happened to me? 2201101. This is our core one A plus study group. It's the study group where I ask you questions that come directly from the exam objectives. And hopefully you will be following along and answering questions with us. We hope you do. I want to thank you for being here. If you're watching here live, I'll give you instructions in just a moment on how to participate. If you're watching the replay, don't worry. You can follow along with us even though you weren't here live. There's bound to be something here that you're going to learn. We're going to start today with uh, how you participate. So if you want to pop open a new browser window and go to professormesser.com slash QA, you could also, if you want to manually type everything, you could download the VVox app. VVox is the service that we use to configure uh, and set up this entire online voting system, if you will, the Q&A system. So if you do that, you'll be able to use the app, but it will ask you for an ID. The ID is on the screen there, 113-592-391. Where is it? There it is, right down here at the bottom. Uh, that's what's going to be on the screen. In fact, it's on the screen right here. Hopefully, uh, let's see if I can put me up there. No, I cannot. Because why would I want to do that? There we go. Or maybe down here out of the way. I got to turn on my macros so I can get over here. There we go. Get out of the way there. So this is, if you're able to see this and you're able to put a pin in the, the virtual map that we have here, you can see that people are joining from all over the world to, uh, to check in with us today. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for attending. We love doing these live streams and it's, it's so much more fun when we're all here kind of doing it together. So I think that's fantastic. Uh, we have for you, if you really want to see how this works, uh, we have for you a question. That question is what I call a rewind question because it's one question that I pulled from last month to see if you are doing pretty well with understanding what these different options might be, how to vote online, how to put your answer in. So I have for you a question from last month that I would like you to see if you know. The question asks, which of the following is the last step of a successful DHCP lease? And again, no answering in the chat room. We want to answer online using the link on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, or the links on your screen here. The possible answers are associate, offer, acknowledge, request, or discover. We'll come back to this question in just a bit, but maybe you can think about what that answer might be and see what you might want to lock in. You go to vbox.app uh, and type in the ID 113-592-391 or go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock it in. Both of those will work for you. We'll come back to that question in just a moment. I want to let you know that we uh, do one of these study groups every month. Thank you for being here live. And we also have other things going on. When you're not here watching the live stream, we have YouTube videos, and we have a lot of those that are about to come out here near the end of the year. If you want to keep track of what we're doing on our YouTube channel, go to professormesser.com slash YouTube. We've also got daily A-plus pop quiz questions. They are at professormesser.com slash Twitter. And I have the same questions over on Instagram, but there's a pretty picture to go along with them. Because why shouldn't there be? We all like the pretty pictures. That's that's a good place to go is, uh, is Instagram. There's uh, plenty of other places to go. We have our Discord. We've got LinkedIn. You just type in professormesser.com slash the name of the thing you'd like to find me on. That's one of the best things you can do is to go to any of those links. And if you haven't liked this video already, I realize we're just getting started. Maybe you don't feel it's necessary. Or maybe you're an optimist and you'd love to hit the thumbs up button anyway. We sure would appreciate that too. Don't, don't forget that you can earn a one-hour 
of a webinar category CEU by simply going to professormesser.com uh, slash, well, I won't tell you how to do it. I'm going to tell you sometime in the first hour of this live stream. So we're going to let you wait on this one. So this is a great way to earn a one-hour webinar category CEU. If you're studying for your A-plus, you can collect four of those during a three-year cycle. Obviously, you need, I think, 20 total CEUs to renew your certification. So, so that is indeed uh, an important consideration. Make sure you know what to do with the continuing education units if that's how you plan to renew your certification. So listen in sometime during this first hour. I'll tell you a little bit more. See, there's always a hook there. We'll get you. We'll get you to hang out some with us. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Core One exam, though. Obviously, there are two A plus exams that you need to take and pass to earn your A plus certification. Currently, those are the two twenty eleven oh one and two twenty eleven oh two. Those were released on April the twentieth of twenty twenty two. So, in the world of 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 being able to work through all of these very interesting. Um, things that we do, that, that's not very old in the world of CompTIA. I think uh, April 2022, you're right in the middle of where this should be because we estimate the retirement for this exam will be somewhere around October of 2025. So you got a couple years from today. The point of this is to say, if you're studying, keep studying. Don't think that you're going to wait for some reason and get something different in the future. Well, you are, but it's going to be later on in 2025. Nobody wants to wait for that. You should get your A-plus now. Uh, the exam itself is a 90-minute exam. Uh, you will get a maximum of 90 questions on the exam. You could get fewer than 90 questions. On the 1101, you need to score 675 on a scale from 100 to 900. Kind of an odd scale, admittedly. Uh, the 1102, you need a little bit better score, 700 on that same scale from 100 to 900. Today, we're going to be focusing on the 1101, though. So don't worry about uh, anything relating to the 1102 unless you come back two days from now when we do a live stream study group for the 1102. Today is all about 1101, though. The 1101 exam itself, the one we call the Core 1 exam, is mobile devices, networking, hardware, virtualization and cloud computing, and hardware and network troubleshooting. So you've got quite a bit to go through. There's plenty to work through on those. Um, and all the questions today will come from those five domains. So that's always a good way to sort of focus in on the topics that we have here. Don't forget that we have a replay of this live stream available immediately afterwards. The This is also something where I create a podcast version, an audio-only version in a podcast format. And you can find that to download into your favorite podcast listening program at professormaster.com slash podcast. You'll also find us on your favorite streaming service. So if you're on Spotify or uh, Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts, we're there as well. So wherever you listen to your podcasts, hopefully we're there waiting for you. If we're not, let us know because I'll be glad to add myself to whatever podcast listening service you happen to use. I think I've I've covered the bases, I think, of the big ones. So that's the important part. We also have a video replay of this live stream available immediately afterwards on YouTube. You can go to professormesser.com slash YouTube, and you'll notice that about a day later that suddenly there will be timestamps that, as if it was magic, suddenly appear in the YouTube video description. Well, behind the scenes, not really magical. Well, it kind of is because... Uh, Lori, my marketing manager, who's watching this replay. Hi, Lori. She's going through all of this video. She is watching it probably at 2x speed and putting in all of the timestamps in this list. So she's the one that does all the hard work and heavy lifting on this one. Thank you, Lori. Uh, chat room, if you like using the live stream uh, timestamps on all of our study groups, please make sure you give Lori a heads up in the chat. Tell her hello. Uh, she's working hard to make sure she gets those available for you. And you can go back years to find these timestamps, which is pretty great. Don't forget that we have a chat, 24-7 chat available because I can't broadcast live all day, every day. I know that would be great, wouldn't it? But instead, you can find us and many other people over on our Discord server. Go to professormesser.com slash Discord. And that's a great way to check in with us, send me a note, talk with others, study with others. This is the internet. We can do all of that. You go to professormesser.com slash discord and you can join us there when we're not here live. 
Also want to let you know that eventually you will need to take your exam. It's true. Uh, unfortunately, you have to pay for it. That's one of those things in life that you have to pay for your certification exams. Now, you can go to the CompTIA website and pay full price. Not going to stop you. But you could come to the Professor Messer website and get a discount on the vouchers. It's already built into the voucher price on my website at professormesser.com slash vouchers. Also, we'll let you know that if you're purchasing vouchers on my site, I'll give you even a little bit more. So not only are you paying less, you're getting more. How does that work? Well, it's the Internet. And instead of you simply just getting a voucher, how about I give you a list of every tip and trick that I've compiled to get you through this exam and perhaps even get you earning some extra points during the exam itself. I document all of this in my exam hacks ebook. And if you purchase a voucher on my site, you get the exam hacks ebook for free. This is only available with a voucher purchase or a success bundle purchase. You cannot purchase the exam hacks book by itself as much as people keep asking. Nope, can't have it. You have to either get the success bundle or purchase a voucher. And I find it's a good way also to kind of get your mind in gear for taking an industry certification exam. And some, of, some of these tips are specific to CompTIA, but some of these tips can broadly be used for any certification exam you might be taking. If you'd like to learn more about the vouchers, go to professormesser.com slash vouchers. Let's talk about that question we asked earlier. Which of the following is the last step of a successful DHCP lease? Is it associate, offer, Acknowledge, request, or discover. Well, let's uh, stop our poll and see how we did. And you can see that 75% of you say the answer is acknowledge. We have 9% that say associate. We have 6% that say offer, 5% that say request, 2% that say discover. Well, this is one of those where knowing where the DHCP lease process is and knowing that there are four steps in that process, the one that we are looking for is the acknowledge step. That will tell you the acknowledgement that everyone has received what they wanted, they grabbed the IP address that they wanted, and they send back a message saying, this is the one we're getting, and it's the DHCP server that sends a message back to the user saying, oh, you wanted that IP address, you got it. So that is the correct answer. And you folks did great. 75% of you say acknowledge is the last step of the DORA process, D-O-R-A. And that last A is for acknowledge. Well done with that one. Some of you remembered that one from uh, last month. That was one that came from that previous study group. So how about now we focus on some new questions? I think that's a great idea. I have some new questions for you. They come from the, uh, a, a performance-based question was the important part of this. Uh, you may not even realize when you take your exam, the first handful of questions you get on your exam are not multiple choice questions. The one that we just did, that's a multiple choice question where you have a question and there's multiple answers to choose from. So one of the things that I like to do in my study groups is to give you a performance-based question right out of the gate. So I have for you a brand new performance-based question, and this is the one that we will discuss. List the protocol, TCP or UDP, and the port number. And I have a list of five different things that you can list through to tell me the port number. And these port numbers, by the way, are the ones specific to the 2-2011-01 exam. Now, if you've not looked at your exam objectives, you may not know what this list is. So you may want to select these from the list. Here are the five different options. They are query a database for authentication, connect to a remote terminal in the clear, synchronize email across multiple mail clients, control the remote desktop of a Windows laptop, and secure all website traffic in a browser. What would be the protocol, TCP or UDP, and more perhaps more importantly from CompTIA's perspective, but not for the world's perspective, the port number. So hopefully you'll get both of those in the answer to this. If you think you know the answer, put it into your VBox front end. It is a fill in the blank. So if you think you know the answers, you can start plugging them in and putting in more details 
of what this might be. See if you happen to know what these are. So for each of these, for I've got five different scenarios here, I need five different port numbers. They are, again, query, query a database for authentication, connect to a remote terminal in the clear, synchronize email across multiple mail clients, control the remote desktop of a Windows laptop, and secure all website traffic in a browser. There's lots of different options here. In fact, some of these might have multiple port numbers you could choose. So let's see what you come up with. Obviously, we're more focused on the port list that is in the 220-1101 exam objectives. See if you can think none what this might be and plug them in in the VBOX app. One of the other things you'll notice about this is that this is a fill-in-the-blank question. I'm not giving you options to match. On your exam, you will probably get options to match. In fact, they might give you 10 port numbers, and they'll tell you to sync them up to these five. So you might have five left over. This is where it's pretty important to know your port numbers and to lock these in. On your exam, you probably won't get a fill-in-the-blank question. At least traditionally, CompTIA has not offered fill-in-the-blank questions. But that doesn't mean you wouldn't get one. There is a possibility that you could get a fill-in-the-blank question. So I, I want you to, of course, kind of take this question, perhaps not as a literal example of a performance-based question, but certainly a very close example of the style of question and certainly topic of question that you might get on a performance-based question. Again, you'd fill in the answer. Go to vbox.app, use the ID 113-592-391, or you can use that link right there on the screen, professormaster.com slash QA, which is so much faster. If you're working in a browser, that might help you a little bit. If you got the app, you just type that ID in one time and you're locked in. You don't have to worry about typing the ID in every time to have that. So it's one of those that might help you as you are stepping through answering the question. A number of you have got your answers in. I think a lot of people are kind of going through this one and trying to figure out because it's a multiple step process. I'm not just asking you protocol and port number. And I think a lot of people study that way. I think they they have kind of that uh, that flashcard mentality of here's a port number, here's a protocol name, here's a port number, here's a protocol name, which is interesting and and relatively important. But you also have to know what those protocols do. When are you using those port numbers? How do you implement these? What if you had to configure? Somebody came up to you and said, "Hey, we need to block." all traffic on our server uh, that queries a database for authentication. OK, what? Hmm, OK, I got to come up with a port number then to put into the firewall, or at least a protocol if it's a next generation firewall, and figure out what I need to, to add to that piece. So that's the part you have to do. And a lot of people will say, well, just Google it. Well, that, that's great, but they might give you a list of 100 of these that you need to do. You should know them off the top of your head. And, and you will eventually. I know that getting into this for the very first time, you may find that it's kind of hard to step through this as someone who's never touched port numbers before. But you will find once you get in and start using them constantly that this is just going to be second nature. So don't worry too much about that. Let's step through each one of these and see if we can answer this question of defining what protocol and port number might be used for this. So let's step through them one at a time and see if my list matches what your list might be. We'll start with the first one at the top, which is query a database for authentication. And you can see that uh, I don't really have anything listed there at the moment. So let's figure out what you might use. Authentication tends to lead me down the road of AAA. So now we're thinking about different protocols that you could use for authentication. And perhaps here we go, TCP 389 LDAP is the one that is uh, most associated with this one. So hopefully LDAP is, is what you chose as well, TCP 389. There are other protocols you could use for this as well. We'll talk about some of these others in just a moment. That's the one I just happened to put into that list. But if you used another authentication protocol, you could certainly do that as well. Let's do another one. I've got one uh, for B, connect to a remote terminal in the clear. Well, we're not using SSH because it says in the clear, we must be using Telnet, which is TCP port 23. 
So that's another good example of two different protocols that functionally do exactly the same thing. SSH, well, effectively the same thing. Uh, SSH and Telnet provide very similar things to be able to make this work. So if you are someone who is trying to send information to a console and not have that traffic encrypted, you would use Telnet. Not sure why you would do that. Probably not a good idea. Should always use SSH. There are some useful things you can do with Telnet, but probably using it as a console, not a good idea at all. So that's that's an important part of this. Next on our list is answer C, synchronize email across multiple mail clients. There's a lot packed into that little sentence, isn't it? And you would use TCP port 143, which is IMAP4. That's one big difference between POP3, which is the post office protocol, and IMAP, Internet message Messaging Protocol. This is, IMAP is especially useful because everything is stored on the server, and you can have multiple clients accessing that single server database, so everything is synchronized across all of your mail devices. It makes it very nice if you're using this, and probably one of the big reasons why we use IMAP so much more regularly or more popularly uh, and more populous. I think that's what it would be for a protocol other than POP3. POP3 has its use, but... Uh, there's much more functionality in IMAP. Answer D is control the remote desktop of a Windows laptop. Everybody should have gotten this one. Controlling the remote l desktop, even the term is there, remote desktop. I put it in the, the words, in the sentence itself. That is the remote desktop protocol, or RDP, and that uses TCP port 3389 to be able to connect to that Windows laptop. Lastly, is it a gimme or is it not a gimme? I think a lot of you, I'm going to scroll through the list. You can't see it in front of you, but I'm scrolling through the list. A lot of you got this last one, which is great. Uh, this last one in the list is secure all website traffic in a browser. That's HTTPS. So certainly it would be T UD. I said UDP. It's not UDP. Who did that? I did that. That's Watch, watch how this changes magically. Uh, it's actually TCP. There we go. So this is how we edit always when we're doing our videos. We'll just we'll just get rid of that and post everybody. You'll never see it. No, we're going to keep it in. Why wouldn't we? And there we go. Uh, the TCP port 443 is indeed commonly used for HTTPS. That S is there for savings and for security. Maybe not savings, but certainly for security. Uh, that's how you would secure all website traffic in a browser. If you go to professormesser.com, you'll notice it always shows up as HTTPS. Even if you typed in HTTP, it moves it over to HTTPS. So there you go. That's that's the goal, is to make sure that all of your traffic is encrypted always. And that's what we do on our website. So there is the answer. Querying a database for authentication is LDAP, or TCP port 389. Connecting to a remote terminal in the clear is done with Telnet, which is TCP port 23. Synchronizing email across mail clients. IMAP4 is great for that. That is TCP port 143. We've got control the remote desktop of a Windows laptop, TCP 3389. And then secure all website traffic in a browser, TCP port 443. So a number of you have noticed there's, there's a little bit of a dip in the performance. Google turned us off for a second, but they turned us right back on. So don't worry, you've caught up to everything. There's the answers on the screen we were looking for. All the protocols, all the port numbers. I think you'll be okay now. It's one of those where occasionally that's what happens with live streams and with YouTube. So that's not unusual here. Uh, it's kind of a normal part of this. So we'll see how we do with additional stream information and seeing that's there. But we got more questions for you. And I want to give you one of those questions right now. Now, I want to be sure that I can give you this next question on the list. Here is the next one that we're working through. A storage array is showing a failure of two hard drives. The users report all systems and data are accessible. Which of the following best describes this configuration? Would it be RAID 1 plus 0, RAID 5, ECC, RAID 1 or RAID 0? Which one would that be? Now, if you think you know the answer, of course, no answers in the chat room, please. You want to answer by visiting professormesser.com slash QA. 
or you can, of course, put that information into the VVox app. The details are on your screen right there. So that might help you figure out what you need to do. This is also a very common question that you might run into, especially if you have scenarios where hard drive failures are common. So see how you do with this particular answer. This might be one that can help you a bit. Go to professormesser.com slash QA. Number of you already locking in your answer. I like watching the numbers move on the screen as the answers are going in. Makes me wonder if we all knew this one, if we didn't know this one. Are we working through the details of it? We, we're never quite sure. So we'll see how we do with this. Uh, storage array is showing a failure of two hard drives. The users report all systems and data are accessible. Which of the following best describes this configuration? There's got to be an answer for this one. So we'll have to see if this matches what you think the answer is. number of you have locked in your answers. I'm going to give you a second more to get those in there. And now let's close the poll and see how you did. And we can see that 35, almost a tie, 36% say RAID 1 plus 0, 35% say RAID 5. And then we have 19% that say RAID 1, 7% that say RAID 0, and then almost 2% say ECC. So that is the one where at least you've got some answers there. So what would this be? You, you have gotten a, an, an array of drives here, we can assume, because it says that. Not really assuming. It says, but two drives failed. Normally, one drive is bad enough. But two drives failing is a pretty bad thing. But how do you keep everything up and running if it says that two drives have failed. Uh, because the users are saying that everything is working fine. The systems are up. The data is accessible. So what would you use in this scenario? Well, I'm glad you asked. You would use RAID 1 plus 0. RAID 1 plus 0 is a stripe of mirrors. And it is one of these scenarios where you could potentially lose two drives or even more, and you would still be up and running. Here's how this would work. So of course, you have uh, some devices that are physically connected. These three physical drives in this example showing where you would store information. In fact, this is RAID 0 between all of these drives. So we are striping information. So block 1, block 2, block 3, back to the first drive, block 4, block 5, block 6, and so on. So we're striping everything on here. Now, of course, you know. RAID 0 is striping. If you lose a drive in RAID 0, the entire array has failed. You'll have to restore from a backup. So this effectively is just RAID 0. So what we're going to do, though, is we're going to create an additional mirror of the stripes. So this is a way that we can duplicate how the striping is being done, which means in this particular picture with these six drives, in a RAID 1 plus 0 array, you could technically lose three drives as long as each of those drives you lost was part of only one single mirror. So you could lose this drive and that drive and this drive, and you'd still be up and running. Everything would be running great. This would be not, no difference to the end users. Of course, you probably don't want to lose that fourth drive because that would be bad. Uh, at that point, hopefully, you've already been notified that some drives are down, and you can go replace those and let them rebuild. That's an important part of RAID, and that's why we always tell you to keep an eye on those alarms and alerts so the moment a drive fails, you can replace it before another drive happens to fall out of that list. It has happened before. It's going to happen again. So make sure you're not one of the folks that, um, that turns into uh, letting the drive sit there for a while as it's failed, and then suddenly you lose another drive. That would be pretty bad. So that is why RAID 1 plus 0, Stripe of Mirrors, would be the correct answer here. And indeed, we have the, the plurality of you, 35, almost 36%. It's kind of hard to see with that color, isn't it? I'll work on that. Don't worry. Uh, but 36% of you say one, 1 plus 0 was the right answer. And indeed, that is correct. That's what we would use. RAID 5, we have 35% of you that chose RAID 5, practically a tie for first place. But RAID 5 can only tolerate a single drive failure. You only have one parity drive in RAID 5. And if you lose any drive in RAID 5, you're still up and running. But the moment you lose that second drive with RAID 5, 
you're no longer running anymore. The entire array has failed. Uh, so that's why in this particular case, if we lose two hard drives, RAID 5 would have already failed. The users would not be reporting all systems and data are accessible. And that's why RAID 5 would not be the right answer. RAID 1, 19% of you said RAID 1. RAID 1 is mirroring. And mirroring relies on there being a mirror. You lose two, rate, two of the mirrors, and you're having a problem with that one. So that's not going to help you either. RAID 0, as we've already mentioned, can't even lose one drive. That wouldn't work either. So uh, that would not be the best choice. Uh, certainly, you couldn't lose two. Once you lost the first one, your array is down. And then ECC is a, well, there's many different definitions of ECC. The one I was thinking about here was for memory and dealing with parity and correction of memory. Our question was about hard drives. So that is that is what you run into with this, is, uh, is working through what these differences might be between these four RAID types. These are the only four RAID types you need to know for the exam. RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID 1 plus 0, what some people call RAID 10, uh, as we said here. RAID 10, or 1 plus 0, is indeed a stripe of mirrors. You're effectively striping pairs of drives that are mirrored in that scenario. So that is your answer. It's what we were looking for. That is the one that is probably best describes this configuration. So hopefully, that is the one that would be perfect to have this here. Maybe that's one that as you're working through the details, uh, that's the one from a RAID perspective that you'll probably find the most when people are talking about losing multiple drives. So the little tip for you as you're working on your exam. Let's do another multiple choice question. I've got one here. This next question on our list asks, a company uses a cloud-based application for time tracking. The company is responsible for installing, upgrading, and maintaining the operating system and software on the cloud server. Which of the following best describes this model? Is it SaaS, hybrid, IaaS, community, or PaaS? I said SaaS. It's SaaS for those of you that are listening on the podcast side. A company uses a cloud-based application for time tracking. The company is responsible for installing, upgrading, and maintaining the operating system and software on the cloud server. Which of the following best describes this model? Is it SaaS, hybrid, IaaS, community, or PaaS? If you think you know the answer, you can follow the links on your screen to put your answer in. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We'll go to professormesser.com slash QA or use the links on your screen to be able to choose the correct answer. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. Be able to step through this particular question. You might be able to piece together all of the different ideas, options, and things that might fit. And there's probably some that don't fit the, this at all. Maybe you can throw those out immediately, and then you would have fewer to choose from. And that's an important consideration on the exam because you want to make the best educated guess you can if you don't happen to know the answer. Sometimes it's just a guess. Sometimes you're just taking a stab. But in this particular case, we are trying to figure out what really would be the best possible answer for this. See if you can, can break that down and see the details. We'll have to see what it happens to be. This is, uh, if you think you know, lock in your answer. Number of you already locked in your answer on these to make this happen. So let's see how you did with this one. Let's step through the different options on these to get, get more of a familiarity with what these could, could really turn out to be. The question again asks, a company uses a cloud-based application for time tracking. The company, use, is re, the company is responsible for installing, upgrading, and maintaining the operating system and software on the cloud server. Which of the following best describes this model? Is it SaaS, hybrid, IaaS, community, or PaaS? Let's see how you did with this one. We're going to stop the polling. And we can see that 41% say it's IaaS. We have 32% say it's SaaS. We have 18% that say it's PaaS. And of course, we have... Uh, 7% that said hybrid, and not even a percent of you said community. So I think that's probably a good place to go if you're trying to kind of break down what these different options are. That is kind of the options available, what you would commonly see. Certainly, 
on the security side. So in this particular case, we've got a few things that we would deal with. In fact, I have the wrong graphic up. So this is, that's not going to help you. We'll have to talk through them of which one these are and figuring out the details. The real key on this one is if you look at what's happening here, it's obviously a cloud-based application. The company is responsible, the company being the company using the cloud-based service. So effectively, the client is responsible for installing, upgrading, and maintaining the operating system and software on the cloud server. So effectively, the, the, the client, the company who owns the software, has to do everything. They have to install the operating system. They have to install the application. They have to maintain the operating system. They have to upgrade the software. They have to do everything. They have to make sure that everything is going to work on this one. They are the ones totally responsible for what happens with this. And that particular model, if we look at, uh, here, here's a graphic, for example, that gives you a perspective of the different models. You could, of course, have everything on premises. That would be a model where there is no, uh, no cloud to, to speak of. So that's not the issue that we're dealing with. In that scenario, of course, the client is going to be managing every aspect of that application. If it's software as a service, it's sort of the other side of it, where the client does nothing. They just show up and log in, and everything is there. They don't have to upgrade everything. They don't have to deal with any of the specifics. Uh, it is one of those questions where I think if you are are using Google Mail, you're using some service where you just log in and everything is available to you, that's software as a service. But if you are responsible for uh, configuring really pretty much everything, the operating system, the middleware, the runtime data, the data itself, and the application, and you're the one that has to manage it, infrastructure as a service is what you need to know. So hopefully you're familiar with some of the things that are associated with these different cloud-based models. This is taken directly from my video, Section 4.1, Cloud Models. So this is a good one to go to to kind of break down where does the responsibility start and end for things that are in the cloud. So I think that's a, a good way to present it. Maybe that's one that, that works for you. Infrastructure as a service certainly describes this question as well. Uh, to understand that, well, if you're handling the operating system all the way up to the application, most likely infrastructure as a service. And indeed, we have 41.5% say infrastructure as a service is what I would choose as well. And that's also why software as a service would not be the correct answer for this. And platform as a service is really is one where the cloud provider gives you all the building blocks you need to build an app, but you're still the one that has to actually build the app and maintain the data. So a little bit different, kind of a, a an in-between spot between infrastructure and software would be the platform right in the middle. You can think of platform as a service as a bunch of building blocks. Put a bunch of Legos together, that's platform as a service. And that's why it would not be the correct answer here, although 18% of you did choose platform as a service. A hybrid service is one where you have a little bit of public cloud, a little bit of private cloud. Or you could even use multiple public clouds. That's another hybrid scenario. This question didn't talk about multiple clouds, internal, external, private, public. Didn't even discuss those. So hybrid would not be our correct answer. And then lastly, community, which would be a group of organizations that have a similar goal. Maybe they are all organizations that have a, a financial goal, or maybe they are all community services, and they want to all share the same cloud. You can do that. We refer to that shared cloud as a community cloud. Would not fit this scenario at all. The, the answer here, the one that really fits the best for this one, is indeed infrastructure as a service. 41.5% of you did a great job with that one. That is the right answer. That's the one you should choose. That's the right selection. Hopefully, that's the one you got as well. Make sure you know those cloud-based services. Well, as we've already seen, there's a lot of information on this exam from a lot of different topics. You have networking. You've got uh, a little bit of, of cloud-based services. You have hardware and a little bit of operating system and troubleshooting along with that. There's a lot in the core one. And then the core two, of course, is operating systems and security and a lot of other topics. 
Now, on my course, you probably have noticed that my course is 137 videos, 19 hours of content for both of them. And although I would love it if everyone was able to read through every single bit of that, uh, I recognize that not everybody has time for that. So it would be nice to have all of this information in one place, wouldn't it? And that's why I created my course notes. The course notes are designed to give you an overview of the entire video course, all of the text, all of the graphics, all of the charts, all of the diagrams, um, everything, all the tables, everything that's important for this exam, I put into these course notes. The course notes are designed to give you the best possible review of those videos because everything from the video is in there. And not only do I have the digital version that you just saw, but there is also a physical version that's available that you can get. And if you buy the physical version, you get the digital version for free. So while you're waiting on this to be delivered to you, because we do ship it to you anywhere in the world, you can, of course, download the digital version and start reading through it and studying right now. There's no delays on that. You can immediately download anything you purchase from those digital versions. Uh, this is a great way to check off the things you know. It's a great summary of everything that's in our videos, and it might help you with your studies as well. If you'd like to learn more about that, go to professormesser.com slash 1101 notes. And of course, you can figure out the details of that one too. So let's do some more. I've got more questions for you. Uh, let's, let's step through our next question on the list. This question asks, because everybody wanted a, a printer question. So here we go. The printer question asks, the output from an inkjet printer shows an unintended blank line. I should say black line. What has happened to me? Why can I? <laughs> That's the second time. See, this is why I have you here. But this one was right. Why did it say blank on the other one? It should be black. No, B-L-A-C-K. There we go. This is this is the editing that we do in real time because it's live. Uh, an, an unintended black line down the length of the page. There you go. Uh, and some of you already said in the, in the chat room, yeah, black line. That's right. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for this issue? And I have some to choose from. Just ignore the unintended misspelling there. The out output from an inkjet printer shows an unintended black line down the length of the page. Which of the following would be the most likely reason for that issue? Is it a scratched photosensitive drum, an incorrect printer driver, a faulty pin in the print head, a low toner, or a dirty print head? Now, if we think we know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer, or you can follow the links on the screen for the VBox app if that's what you would like to do. So there you go. You've got a few different things. What would a blank line look like? What would that be? How would you know if it was a blank line? Isn't the entire page full of blank lines? Maybe, maybe that's what it is. Uh, but no, this is a black line. So that changes things a little bit. Uh, the, that, that's one of those that you really have to worry. Maybe you're using black paper and there's a blank line. No, nobody's doing that. It would really be, it would really be a black line that would make the most sense for this question. Uh, that's just my problem. That's all on me. I get to, I get to make those problems all the time. Normally I catch them, but sometimes they leak out into the real world. Sorry about that. We'll figure out the details. Uh, and being able to work through it. Of course, as always, please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We will talk all about it and figuring out uh, what you think the answer might be once we lock in our answers on this one. Printer questions are going to come up on the exam. Certainly, printer questions are going to come up on the exam. There is a lot on the exam dealing with printers. Um, so it just seems like it's going to be obvious. It's going to be going to be one of those where, of course, you're going to get a printer question of some kind uh, and making these happen. Let's see if you know the answer to this one. I think we've got a number of people that blocked in their answer. So let's go now and see what the answer happens to be. The question again asks, the output from an inkjet printer shows an unintended black line down the length of the page, which the following would be the most likely reason for this issue. Is it a scratched photosensitive drum? an incorrect printer driver, a faulty pin in the print head, a low toner, or a dirty print head. So let's close the poll and see how we did. We can see that 48, no, let's say 49% 
say that it is a dirty print head. 19% say a scratched photosensitive drum. We also have 22% that say a faulty pin in the in the print head. So really all three of those pretty high numbers, certainly up above the 20, around the 20% and higher range. So that's good. Uh, but we do have 5% that say low toner and 4% that say an incorrect printer driver. So which one would this be? A, a, a output down, a black line down the length of the page would look something like this. There's your test page. And you can see that you have a black line that goes all the way down this. Now, the cause of that could be different depending on the type of printer that you're using. So of course, this type of problem uh, is not what you'd like to see. If it's, a, if it's a laser printer, it probably has a scratched photosensitive drum. That drum that goes around and around probably has a scratch all the way around it. And so every time you print, there's this long line that is created as the drum is going around and around and around and having the printer come out underneath it. But that's not our problem. This problem that we had said the output from an inkjet printer. Inkjet. So uh, not, not a laser printer. It was an inkjet. And if it's an inkjet printer, then it's probably an issue with the print heads. That's exactly the problem that we've run into is that the print heads are just dirty. And as it's going across the page, it is leaving information there. Um, and if it's one long black line down the page, you're probably printing landscape, and it's just going all the way down the page and printing that black line all the way through as we, as we have an output that looks like this when we're done. Certainly not the best looking output when that happens. So we would want to either clean the print heads on an inkjet or replace the print head completely, which would be replacing, commonly replacing an ink cartridge. If it's a laser printer, you, you sometimes can't replace just the photosensitive drum. You have to replace the entire uh, toner cartridge itself because many toner cartridges include the drum with them. Uh, a few laser printers don't do that. They're separate, but very few, it seems. So that's the answer we were looking for. It's an inkjet printer. So the problem is the print head. And you can see that about 50% of you did choose print head for that answer. You can see that the 20% of you that said scratched photosensitive drum would have been right if that said laser printer. But it didn't. It said inkjet printer. So that's not going to be what we want. Um, so 20% of you, not the correct answer on that one. Uh, faulty pin in the print head, same scenario. Inkjet printers don't have pins in their print heads. Uh, a, a impact printer or dot matrix printer has pins in the print head. Um, but this is not an impact printer. It's not a dot matrix printer. It's an inkjet printer. So the 22% of you that chose that one would not be the right answer either, unfortunately. Uh, low toner, 5% of you said low toner. Again, it's an inkjet printer. There is no toner, so that can't be the right answer. And then an incorrect printer driver. Although, technically speaking, I imagine you could have a bug in a printer driver somewhere that would potentially cause this type of problem with the output because your print driver could cause any type of problem with the output. The question asked, which would be the most likely reason for this issue. I've never seen a printer driver, an incorrect or bad printer driver, do this. If you got the bad, a bad printer driver, it's probably garbage that you're seeing on your output. So it's not very likely. In fact, it's very unlikely. The most likely reason by far is a dirty print head. That is the right answer. And 48, 49% of you got that one absolutely correct. Well done with that. If you're watching this video for continuing education unit credit, which means you already have your A-plus certification and you're looking to renew, then I'd like to send you an email that includes a one-hour webinar category CEU verification. And the way you would do that is you have to follow these instructions. And you must follow the instructions. These are part of it as well. You go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website, and there you would click the link for Contact Us. There was a form that comes up when you type Contact Us. And in that form, put your name, put your email address in the body, or excuse me, the, the subject line of that particular form. Please put September 2023, so I know what study group this came from. Uh, one of the four anyway. And then in the body of the message, on a line by itself, 
put the super secret code words of, let's do dirty printhead. Dirty Printhead. That's exactly what we'll use as our super secret code words of the month. Dirty Printhead. Go to ProfessorMesser.com. You can click the Contact Us link. Put in your name, your email address. Put in September 2023 in the subject line. And in the body of the message, put the words Dirty Printhead. Clean them up. Dirty Printhead. That's what we want. And in fact, if you want to put anything else in that message, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Just uh, move down a couple of lines. I read through every single one of these. So hopefully that will that will help you a bit um, as you're going through those. It is the Contact Us link that you're looking for. Did really well with that question. About half of you got this one right, which is fantastic. Those that you that didn't get it right, now you know. So you'll get it right on the exam. So that's the way it works here. It, every wrong question is a right question on the exam. It's the way you look at it. You don't learn anything unless you get it wrong, right? Wrong, right? Correct? That's, that's absolutely true. So let's do another one. We got time for more questions. This next one on our list is this question that asks, a technician is replacing the inverter in a laptop. Which of the following would this address? Would it address a black screen, blurry text and graphics, incorrect screen orientation, weak wireless signals, or intermittent shutdowns. A technician is replacing the inverter in a laptop. Which of the following would this address? Would it address black screen, blurry text and graphics, incorrect screen orientation, weak wireless signals, or intermittent shutdowns? If you think you know the answer, follow the links on your screen. Go to professormester.com slash QA, however you can get here and lock in what you think the answer might be. A lot of people putting their answers in on this one really quick. I'm thinking we might have a good number at the end of this one. We'll see if we know exactly what this is going to do for us. What, which of the following would that address indeed? And maybe you happen to know what this one is. Let's see how, how you work out with these. Again, of course, please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We'll figure it out as we go along. Uh, this is one... I have also run into this. I have also dealt with this. But let's see. Uh, let's see how we do to, with this. Let's see if we really know. Sometimes we put in our answers very quickly, and I think we must all know this one. And it doesn't always work out that way. So it's always a mystery. I'm not looking. I can, I can peek at the answers, but I don't because it's more fun this way. So we'll see. We'll see what this answer happens to be. Uh, I think a number of you have got your answers locked in. So let's see how you did. The question asks, a technician is replacing the inverter in a laptop. Which of the following would this address? It would address a black screen, blurry text and graphics, incorrect screen orientation, weak wireless signals, or intermittent shutdowns. And how did you do? Let's see. Of the folks, 62% say the answer is a black screen. We have 20% that say intermittent shutdowns. And then you've got 8% that say incorrect screen orientation, 7% say blurry text and graphics, and then 2% say weak wireless signals. So what would it be? 62% is a pretty big number for black screen. Let's see if we happen to know what this one is. Of course, this revolves around the backlight of your laptop computer. That's how this particular uh, component, the inverter, is associated with your laptop. The inverter is something to do with the backlight. Don't worry. We're going to talk about the inverter in just a moment. I And in fact, if you're working with an inverter, you are probably most likely working with CCFL or a cold cathode fluorescent lamp. We don't commonly see these any longer, but they are on older laptops, and you will almost certainly run into this if you're trying to repair an older laptop. If you're working on a relatively new laptop, it probably doesn't have a fluorescent lamp as the backlight. It's probably an LED as the backlight. And LEDs don't need an inverter. Look a little bit, a little bit like this in the back. There's all the LEDs that are on the back of a, a display. But we're dealing with a fluorescent lamp, which looks very different than this. The problem is that fluorescent lamps are that you need them to be able to see anything through that LCD display. The problem is the laptop is using DC power and the fluorescent lamps need AC power. 
So when you to convert from DC into AC, you need one of these devices right here, one of these inverters. You, you give it some input, and it outputs uh, some, some of the, uh, uh, the AC that you need to be able to light up that particular piece in the back. That's what we were shooting for. Those are the details. So maybe that's the scenario that uh, you were thinking as we stepped through this. Um, if you aren't sure if it's the backlight, this is the little hint for you. For those of you that have not worked with these older laptops before, get yourself a flashlight. And you think the screen is black, but if you point the flashlight at the screen, you'll notice that you can kind of make out the text and the graphics. You can almost see it because you're shining the light through the LCD just a little bit uh, and getting it there. Um, and so that might tell you, oh, the problem's with the backlight. The video is working fine. I'm just not able to see it because there's no light behind it. So you may need to replace that inverter. It could, of course, be the display itself. You might have to display replace the whole display. Uh, that's certainly an option, but it's something you may have to do to get this machine back up and running. It's not a difficult install. As folks in the chat room are saying, is that is that a problem? Is it hard? Is it easy? How do you do this? Uh, it is relatively involved to get the covers and the bezels off of the laptop and unscrew the display so you can get behind it because that's usually where the inverters are. And then you replace the inverters, which usually plug in or um to the display that way. There's there's a lot of different options. Every laptop is a little bit different. Some laptops are easier than others. Laptops in general are challenging. So when I say some are easier than others, you're already dealing with a difficult situation with tiny little screws and laptop engineering that is squeezes a lot of hardware into a tiny little space. Uh, so if you're like me and you kind of work with hammers and you get frustrated easily, maybe a career in laptop repair is not for you. Maybe you, if you're someone, though, that is more methodical and you're more zen and you can deal with these tiny little screws, then perhaps you'll be fine with the laptops. I've, I've had my own share of replacing laptop components. Not a big fan, quite honestly, probably because it's just too small. Uh, but there's lots of ways to fix that, though. Well, when you need to change it, you got to make that happen. So absolutely, that's what you would use. It is the inverter that manages that backlight, which means that if the screen goes black, it very possibly could be the inverter in this older laptop that is causing that screen to be black. Hopefully, that's giving you some perspective. Uh, the other answers here, intermittent shutdowns. The inverter has nothing to do with the uh, the powering on and powering off of the system. It is only used to power the fluorescent lamps, which means if the inverter breaks or if there's a problem, the lamp doesn't work. But your laptop will still continue to work. You probably know someone who had their screen go out and they just plugged in an external monitor and they just used their laptop kind of as the keyboard to their external monitor. And all you have to do is replace the backlight or, or replace the inverter and you might be back up and running and working again. Uh, the other options here are 8% of you say uh, incorrect screen orientation. A laptop, of course, you're dealing with, is it is it portrait or is it landscape? You can move them back and forth that way. Uh, screen orientation and the inverter has nothing to do with screen orientation. Usually there's a button on a tablet or a laptop that allows you to move the orientation around. Uh, in this case, the inverter has nothing to do with that. And then you've got blurry text and graphics. Um, this this might mean that it's time for uh, an eye exam, or it could be that you've just got the wrong resolution selected on the laptop. The inverter has nothing to do with how crisp, crisp or not crisp the text and graphics might be. So inverter's not going to going to do anything for you there. And then weak wireless signals, as we've already found out, the inverter has nothing to do with the wireless network. It would not have anything to do with wireless signals. The answer the vast majority, or certainly a very large majority of you, say 62% say it's the black screen, and you're absolutely correct. Now, I know it's the top of the hour, but let's keep going with this. Let's bring this down to another question I have for you. It's a very simple question, but do we have a simple answer? The question asks, which of the following provides MU-MIMO functionality? And the possible answers are 802.11n, 802.11b, 802.11g, 
802.11a or 802.11ax. That's a lot of 802.11s. Each one of those is a real standard version for the 802.11 wireless networks. So let's see if you know which of these provides MU-MIMO functionality. It's got to be one of them, right? In this case, it is one of them. It's not more than one. Um, but figure out which one it is. That's the real question. You have to know your wireless standards for the exam. You have to know the differences between the wireless standards, or at least the, the primary differences between the wireless standards. There are significant differences between all of these different versions of 802.11. But this is a scenario where we're talking very broadly about functionality. So hopefully you're familiar with what these are. Maybe you can lock them in. Let me give you the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA or follow those links at vbox.app to lock in your answer. I'll also remind you, in the second hour, it's coming up. We're going to be answering questions. You can input your question right now using the vbox app. You can go to that separate tab and put in any questions that you might have to discuss um, in our after show. So feel free to lock those in any time to figure out the details. Should be a good one to at least figure out uh, what this one happens to be. See if you know the answer. Which of the following provides MU-MIMO functionality? Is it 802.11N, 802.11B, 802.11G, 802.11A, or 802.11AX? What would it be? We'll have to see if a number of you have already locked in your answers. So I think we're going to accept what you happen to have there. We're going to Stop the poll and see what everybody selected. And you can see that 64% or so say the answer is 802.11ax. But 17% say it's 802.11n. And then we go down to single digits with 9, nine almost 10% say 802.11g, 7% with 802.11a, and then 2% with 802.11b. Well, the key here is MU-MIMO. MU MIMO is the multi user uh, version of multiple input, multiple output, and making all of that there. So, if you're someone who is kind of working through the details of the exam, it might be useful to have a look at the chart that we have in the video itself. And here it is the breakdown of 802.11 A, B, G, N, A, C, and A, X. Now, technically speaking, Multi-user MIMO was introduced with the 802.11 AC version. And we have different flavors of multi-user MIMO in both AC and AX. So if I ask you which one uh, of all of these support MU MIMO, it would be AC and AX. So you'd actually have two choices from there to be able to get that. Uh, there is a, just a MIMO, which is not a multi-user version of it, that was just introduced in, or, or I say initially introduced, in 802.11n to have that there. So you've got some answers there. So of all of these standards that I put on the screen, the only one on this list that matches the multi-user MIMO is the 802.11ax flavor, and indeed, that is the one that most of you discussed. Uh, here it's 64, almost 65% say 802.11ax. So there you go. That's that's it. So the chat room saying, so if you get a question like this in the test, would it be ax? Well, yes, it's the same as what you would answer here. I'm not making these things up. It's the same on the test as it would be here in the real world. Uh, we definitely don't have any differences that I'm presenting to you. This is indeed the answer for there's no other answer. What will we choose here other than that one? There is no other answer. N doesn't support MU-MIMO. A, B, and G don't support MU-MIMO. The only answer on here, for example, which of the following, that's what's, getting, that's what's tripping you up. The question literally asks, of the list of things that are on this page, which one provides MU functionality, MU-MIMO functionality? So there you go. That's why the only possible answer would be 802.11ax. So make sure you look at the list of what's provided to you because you might think of one, oh, it's AC. And then you look through the list and think, AC's not even here. This, this question's wrong. Nope. The question says, of the list of things that are in front of you, which one would you choose? That is, a, by the way, a very common answer um, or type of question on the exam. They do that all the time. 
And the only other option here that has anything to do with MIMO is 802.11n here at the top. But that version of the standard doesn't support the multi-user aspect of MIMO. It only supports MIMO without the multi-user part, which is important. There is a separate video on wireless technologies where I describe the differences of all of those. So you're absolutely right. Doesn't say AC. So what would you choose on the exam? Well, it doesn't say AC, so you wouldn't choose that one. You would choose 802.11ax, which is the right answer, and 65% of you or so got that one absolutely right. Very good question, by the way. I know I kind of teased you a little bit, but I didn't mean to. that Because you were spot on with, wait, there's one missing. That's right. I'm very strategic with the missing. And that's what that's about, is, is you sort of stepping through what all those differences might be for all of those different standards. And you have to memorize them and remember them. Once you start using them a lot, though, you'll find that the exams themselves are, are, are pretty straightforward with what they're asking of you. So stick to what's on the screen. Don't let other things get into the list. Read the questions very specifically, and you're going to do great. There's not going to be a problem with that at all. I think you got it. Well, as you've already seen here, We've gone through a lot of different topics already. And the questions that you'll get on your exam, will they, they will cover also all of those topics from the exam objectives. One thing that I've noticed online, uh, especially a number of you that have gotten practice exams somewhere else, is you've noticed that the exam questions don't follow the exam objectives. Or they might be referencing topics that are covered in previous versions of the exam that you won't be asked about. Uh, it's important when you're studying for your exam that you know your study materials have been specifically written for the exam that you're about to take. Our goal here is for you to get certified. And although I guess it, there's some some uh, advantage, I guess, if you think about it, that having other ideas or other things that are on the exam uh, would somehow be useful, they aren't for getting a certification. That's that's not what you're trying to do. You're trying to get certified. And it would be nice if all the all the topics that you're studying are really topics that would be on the exam. So I thought, well, let's let's create a set of practice exams for you that I have written from scratch to have the same feel as the actual exam, to have similar question styles as the actual exam, and only cover topics that you'll be asked about on the exam. We don't go off the, the script. We don't somehow go over and ask questions about things that have nothing to do with the exam. We stick to the exam objectives. It's so important. These are my practice exams. Let's do one. I have my practice exams right here. I have an extra question for you. So let's step through this extra question that I have. This comes directly from my practice exam, and it says, uh, this is question A30. It says, in which of the following would a lightning cable most likely be used? Would it be connect a server to a display monitor, increase the available memory of a device, remotely control a mobile device, or charge a mobile device? This is, this is really the question in working through these. This is obviously, uh, it's a PDF that we're working through that we're dealing with here. And the PDF is one that we can now annotate if we wanted to. Did you get your favorite PDF reader? If you're using this on a tablet, you can use your stylus and work through the details. Um, these are questions that I think as you step through the exam itself, you will want to be able to kind of use these. The um, This one, uh, because I am on a PDF, let's annotate this a little bit. So you could add uh, some color if you think you'd, you have certain words that are popping out, or maybe you want to select an answer. You can do all of that on the screen. You can work through the details of all of these. So hopefully, this is something that you're familiar with. You kind of work through the details of this. This would be something easy to use. Now, because this is a PDF, though, I have links here that will take you to answers that are here. A quick answer would just be, is it A, B, C, or D? But there's an option here for the details. It's on page 65. Now, this is page 11. So you would, you know, you'd have to kind of scroll up quite a bit to be able to see this one. And if you scrolled up a lot, you'd probably lose your place. So what I've done is I've created links in the PDF where I can simply click the word, the details, and it takes me to page 65, just like that. So I can, of course, read through the question again. And it tells me the answer is D, charge a mobile device, 
and it explains why the Lightning interface would be the best one to use for charging that mobile device. Now, whenever I take one of these exams online, I never get the right answer. I'm always getting questions wrong. Unfortunately, a lot of the things that you'll read through online don't tell you why you got the question wrong. And there's no better time to get an explanation than when you get it wrong. In fact, I would argue, throw out the explanation for the right answer. Give me explanations for the wrong answers. So I said, I'll give you explanations for all of them. So here you go. You can look at answer A, B, or C. And I explained to you why this particular answer doesn't apply to this question. Sort of like we do in the normal study group. When we're here live, we're doing the same thing except in the practice exams themselves. And then, of course, if you've read through this and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know what this question is talking about. I don't know what a lightning cable is. How can I learn more? Well, after every question, I have a QR code and a link that will take you to the objective where this question was written from. It's from Objective 3.1 Copper Connectors. There's a link that you can click on or you can use your phone and simply open up the link to the video right there. Now, once you're done, every I, most, I won't say every, but most PDF readers will have a back button. Mine does right up here at the top, a little back button that's on the screen. And I can click the back button and go back to where I started. And now I can go to the next question on my list. So that is my practice exams book. This is available on my website. I have practice exams for both the core one and the core two. A single book has three separate 90 question exams in there. Each exam has five performance-based questions. So there are 15 performance-based questions in here, uh, 389 pages. And of course, you just saw the digital version, but there's a physical version too. Of course there is. It's a big book. There's a, there's a lot of questions in here. There's a lot of detail, but they are, they are all in this book for you to reference. Uh, and of course, as always, if you get the physical version, you get the digital version for free. It's on my website, professormesser.com slash core1pe. Maybe that's something that can help you too if you're ever trying to step through all of these. I've mentioned a number of times in this study group that the topics that we're going through come directly from the exam objectives. And that's because the objectives are so important to what we're doing. I have a copy of the objectives right here, as a matter of fact. They list out everything you need to know for the exam. I've had people that come to my site, and they, they said they took the exam, and they got a lot of questions of topics they weren't expecting. And I said, well, did you look through the exam objectives? They tell you everything you need to know and every acronym you need to know. It's in the objectives. And they said, well, I just thought it was a summary. I just thought it was a high-level overview. They didn't realize that they tell you every bullet of everything you need to know is in the objectives. And by the way, these objectives, they're free. You don't have to pay for them. You can download them immediately. I have a link over to the CompTIA website. You can go to professormesser.com slash objectives or simply go to your favorite search engine and type in CompTIA exam objectives. It'll be the first link, I'm sure. And that will, that will give you probably the best checklist you will ever need for, for studying for this exam. Because if it's in this list, you could be asked about it on the exam. And although others on the internet, for some reason, will try to tell you that this is not the case, it's very true that CompTIA stays very close to these objectives. They rarely, if ever, go off this list. So your exam, if you know everything that's in the objectives, you're going to pass your exam with no problem because they stay so close to these objectives. Practically 100% of the questions are coming from these objectives. That's how close they stay to them. So that's why I tell you it's so important. If you're working towards this, make sure you're familiar with the objectives. Super important. So that's that's uh, something you can get right now absolutely free, and it will absolutely help you with your studies. We do one of these live group uh, study groups every month. Uh, we do multiples every month, but for the core one, we do one every month. So I have another core one study group scheduled for October the 10th. But of course, I've got other study groups this month here in September. For example, if you want to come back two days from now, it'd be Thursday uh, on September the 7th. Uh, I have a core two study group scheduled for September 7th. I just finished writing all the questions this morning. So we're ready to go when you are, when Thursday hits. Actually, that's when you should show up is on Thursday. Really not when you are, but kind of when I am. We'll, we'll do it on Thursday. We'll have everything you need. And then, of course, in October, on October the 10th and the 12th, we've got study groups for you as, then as well. Plenty to go through. Lots of detail. 
Um, absolutely, it would be good. Yeah, show up on Wednesday. Folks in the chat room now give me a hard time, which I deserve. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, the study group time. We've, we've kind of gone through an hour of Q&A. It has flown by, but we're not done yet. I have for you more Q&A, but this time you are going to ask the questions of me. That's the difference in the next Q&A that we deal with is that the questions are coming from you. We'll talk about the after show in just a moment and how important these questions are going to be. But stick around for that. That comes up immediately after this. Don't go anywhere. Don't forget about the discounted vouchers on my website. Why would you pay full price when they are already discounted on ProfessorMesser.com? Go to ProfessorMesser.com slash vouchers or just follow the link at the top of the screen for the vouchers. We got our course notes and practice exams available on the website. Go to ProfessorMesser.com slash 1101 success. And of course, Follow us everywhere. Uh, click on everything. I don't know. I don't know how people do this uh, when they say yes. You should link and subscribe and click the thumbs up and do, just do all of those things. That's pretty much what they're saying. It actually does help, though. I have folks at YouTube that I I talk to constantly. Uh, they're sending messages back and forth. We're having live meetings. We're we're kind of stepping through how to make this channel better for you. And the reason they talk to me is because you told them to talk to me. And the way you told them is you hit the thumbs up and you subscribe to the channel. And that's what helps us keep this whole party going. So thank you so much for doing that, by the way. Um, it makes a big difference. You may think it's it's nothing. They say it all the time that you should, you know, give us a like and thumbs up and all of those things. But it really does help quite a lot. So thank you so much for your ongoing support. Uh, we got a lot more to go through. Stick around for the next hour of this craziness. There's always something interesting going on. Thank you for being here. See you next time on the A plus study group. Okay. Let's see. First, uh, let me take a sip. Take a sip. And we have this much technology around. You need a mug full of liquid right there on the tape on the desk. It's always a good idea, isn't it? Let's now change our focus. I think I have the details here and then i'll explain to you the best way to go about participating here we're going to remove some of this from the screen i think i can close up uh one of those we will get some of this ready to go and let's turn on the q a to get uh some answers in here if you are in our vvox app let's see if i can close this poll here real quick uh show results show results show results can I close it? I think I can. Um, there we go. We'll hide this out. Now you can see on the screen that you can submit questions. Nope, can't do it there. You have to do it here at any time of the study group. We will be moderating these questions. They are they are available in your VVox app. So feel free to have a look at the options in the VVox app. And I'm going to step through these sort of one at a time to kind of find what we're looking at there. There's an extra tab there to be able to break that down. So maybe that will help you. As we as we kind of break down the differences uh, and the different options that people are asking about, I'm going to pull up the list here. This gives me a single place to go. Lots of questions already coming in. So I'm just going to pick one here near the top and kind of talk about whether this is something that we might want to deal with or not. We'll start with this one from Philip. Uh, Philip asks, you probably get this one a lot. That's no, I, I don't think I get any one question a lot. So I appreciate you asking. Uh, the question asks, if you have a degree in computing, is there any port of point in going back for a plus if you have network plus and security plus already? Well, that that is a question I do see people ask quite a bit. And it does have a little bit of context to it. And let's kind of step through this. Let's assume that you have a degree in computing. I don't know if this is computer science. I don't know if that is an IT degree. There are some places you can get IT degrees. Those are very different. But let's really talk about the meat of the question, which is um, if you have Network Plus and Security Plus, should you go back and get A Plus? I don't know. Should you? This is one where the answer to the question is not based on what you think necessarily. It's not based on what I think necessarily, but more based on what do employers want you to have? We're assuming, of course, that we're approaching this problem from the perspective of someone who would like to either get a job in IT or get a better job in IT. And if you're doing that, 
It always helps if the credentials that you have match the credentials that an employer is looking for. That's that's perfect scenario, isn't it? So if you were to go out and look at the open positions in your area that you are working towards, you didn't say in this question what you were sort of working towards, but that should be the question you need to ask yourself is, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to get my first job in IT? Am I trying to move out of the help desk and move into a different part of IT? Is there a certain area of technology that interests me the most? And are there jobs available in that area? Those are the questions you need to ask because that's going to help you determine what job postings you look for. So now you can go out to the internet. Let's say that you're looking for your first job in IT and you need that sort of help desk, service desk, entry level IT position. And so as you're going through that, you're going to pull up a lot of job postings and they will tell you what they would like you to have. Maybe as you're going through the postings, you realize that more than half of these postings are asking for an A+. Well, I have my Network Plus and Security Plus. Well, that's great, but they didn't ask for Network Plus and Security Plus. They asked for an A+. Plus because from their perspective, the topics covered on the A+, plus best fit the role that this particular job would fill. So especially something like a help desk. You probably don't do a lot of networking on the help desk. You probably don't do a lot of security on the help desk, but you probably do a lot of antivirus, uh, password resets, Active Directory, um, uh, Microsoft Windows, Mac OS type troubleshooting. And that's perfect because that fits the A plus to a T. Or maybe you're located in, maybe you live somewhere in the DC area, the Virginia area here in the US, which of course is a huge area for uh, the federal government. The federal government loves the Security Plus. Really, the Department of Defense loves the Security Plus, and everybody else loves it because the Department of Defense loves it. But the point, though, is when you start looking at jobs in that geography, Security Plus might come up more than A+. Okay, well, now you can change your strategy a bit and decide, all right, we've got now this Security Plus certification. I already have it. Here's a lot of jobs asking for it. I'll now submit my resume. I don't have to go get my A+. Plus. But you could be somewhere else. You could be elsewhere in the country or in the world, and the jobs there might want A+. Plus. Or maybe those jobs want a Microsoft cert, or they want an, uh, an, a, an AWS cert for uh, the Amazon Web Services. Or maybe they want something completely different. So you really have to look at your particular situation, examine the job postings that are in your area, and start compiling and doing the research on that. And I think that's really going to be your best bet for figuring out where you should go with these. That's a great question. Thank you for sending it in. Uh, let's let's do another question. We have more on our list here. A lot of you are you're putting in those questions. Thank you so much. Um, so let's see. Here's another one sort of on the world in the career line. We're going to stick with this this for the moment um, and see what you think of this question. This is from Joe who asks, so I got certified in cybersecurity cert recently. I'm thinking maybe that's the security plus. I'm looking to get into a career in IT slash IS and eventually information security. I like this already. Question is, where would where would be the best to try and start my career? So where do you go? How do you even start this? If you want to get started in IT, and then I like the way you put this, eventually information security. So Joe already recognizes that security in the world of IT is a higher level job position. There don't, there's not generally a lot of entry level positions in, in information security, relatively speaking. Most of the entry level positions in IT are starting with help desk, a little networking, a little operating system. You're working sort of on learning the landscape. And then once you understand operating systems and security or operating systems and networking, you can use that knowledge to jump into the world of security. That's very commonly how this works. So the question here is about how do you start this process? Well, if you look at the YouTube video description of this video, or you go out to my YouTube page at professormesser.com slash YouTube, there is a video there for, um, for learning how to get into IT with no experience. 
It's it's a 30 minute, literally a 30 minute video. And if you know my videos, there's not a lot of of slack time in there. I don't waste time in my videos. We get right to the point and I talk about where what's the important parts of what we're trying to learn. And the four aspects of this are you need you need a job in IT, you should probably get a formal degree, industry certifications, some practical experience, and then you happen to know someone who works there. Those are the four most important elements for getting a job, an entry-level job in IT. You follow those four, you're in pretty good shape. Now, there's other things you can wrap around that, but those are the top four in my mind. So, And I'm kind of speaking as a former hiring manager for a technology role. And that's what we looked for for those entry-level positions. So when you're looking to try and start your career, go get those four things. In that video, I describe in detail what I mean by a formal degree, uh, what an industry certification ranks as, what um, some type of practical experience would qualify as, and lastly, maybe speaks for itself, knowing somebody who already works in the organization. Those are the four things. So I, I really stress very heavily that you create a strategy based around those four elements. And try to understand, are you missing parts of those? Maybe you can fill them in. Maybe you can compensate other elements and get a little more experience or more industry certifications or you know more people that work there if you don't have a formal degree. So you, can, you don't have to have all four, but it helps if you can adjust others around where some shortcomings might be. So I think that's that's a great place to go to get your strategy in place. Everybody's going to have a different strategy, by the way. I don't give you a rail that you have to drive on to get from no IT job to your first IT job because everybody has a different path. Everybody has a different set of goals. Everybody has a different set of experiences and things that they would like to do. And so I, I usually give people a framework and say, for this framework, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. Pick the one that fits for you, and you can move forward with that. I think that's probably a good place to start is with that level of knowledge and trying to figure out how to best get in the door with the knowledge you have or perhaps with knowledge that you may be able to use in the future. So you've got other options there. Hopefully that gives you some ideas of where you can start and focus on. Uh, let's keep going through this list uh, and see what's there. Um, I think this is a pretty good one. This is more of a CompTIA question, but I think it's one that, that comes up quite a bit. Uh, this question asks, do you know if the stackable certifications are provided automatically? For example, the Trifecta plus Linux plus, uh, they are handled automatically. In fact, uh, for those of you that haven't seen these before, let's let's pull up that list of the uh, of the stackable certifications from CompTIA. If you've never heard of these before, uh, a few years ago, CompTIA decided to put different certifications together and give you an idea of what those are. Here are the stackable certifications. So they have certifications for different pathways, infrastructure, security, cybersecurity, you've got a lot of different options here. But what they've done is bundle together different certs to, I don't know, it's more of a, I guess it's more of a, of, of a chance for you to put more colorful uh, labels on your resume or on your web page, I guess. That's one, one of the things this does. So for instance, if you earn your A+, you're obviously A plus certified. If you earn your network plus, you're network plus certified. And if you earn both of them, you are what CompTIA calls the IT operations specialist or the CIOS, CompTIA IT operations specialist. And that gives you the ability to say that's the stackable for the A plus and network plus. Uh, they have a different one for A plus and Linux plus. You're the CompTIA systems support specialist. That's easy to say. Um, there's, there's more on here you can flip through all of the different options that are there. For example, the trifecta we often talk about is A plus, network plus, and security plus. Turns out there's a stackable for that called the CompTIA Secure Infrastructure Specialist, or the CSIS. Now, you may be saying to yourself, 
I've never heard of this before. And you would be correct. No one ever mentions these. No one ever talks about, oh, I've now earned my CompTIA IT operations specialist. And the reason we don't talk about it is because nobody knows what that is. We don't, this is interesting to kind of put in a list, and it certainly makes your resume look better. But I don't know that anybody understands what you mean when you say, I am a CompTIA IT operations specialist. So I would highly recommend, highly recommend that on your resume and other places that you always spell out the individual certs that you have earned, primarily because there are automated processes from the employers that look through your resume to see if certain keywords match. And if you don't have A plus or network plus on your resume, they might throw you out even though you clearly stated that you are a CompTIA IT operations specialist. Employers don't know what that is. So that, I think, is why these the they've continued to add these stackable certifications, but I don't really see a lot of people using them. Um, they're kind of a nice bragging point, and why wouldn't you do that? Because everybody likes to do that. Uh, but in reality, employers are really looking for the name of the cert. So you can use these stackables, put them on your resume, but make sure you also put the actual name of the cert associated with that stackable on there so that it shows up and people can see it. And they'll say, oh, okay, you're A-plus certified. Oh, you're Network-plus certified. Oh, you're Security-plus certified. I didn't realize that because all I thought you were was a secure infrastructure specialist, and I didn't know what that was. You don't want to fall into that trap. So that's what I would say is don't worry so much about the 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 stackable piece of it you should instead worry about have i listed everything on here in a way that a prospective employer would be able to recognize and and really understand that i have these certifications so uh that's my you know it's 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 a, a good and a bad thing i guess just as long as you cover the bases it all turns into a good thing and that's what we should focus on uh, more questions. We'll keep going down this list. Um, there's there's a lot more to go through. Um, there is some folks were talking about the RAID question going way back, saying with RAID 5, uh, you could lose three with RAID 5 and you'd be up. Nope, you can only lose one drive in RAID 5, only a single drive. Uh, RAID 5 only has one extra parity drive. You could have 12 drives in a RAID 5 array. Only one of those drives is parity. So you lose two drives in RAID 5, you're out, you're done. That's it. Um, and I, I actually had to find and download the RAID standard to be to be able to really spell it out. Now, there are, there are nuances to RAID. RAID has many different configurations across many different styles, but we're really focusing on just RAID 5 and not RAID 5 plus something else. You can only lose one drive. Just for the, that's kind of a callback to that previous question, but I just wanted to summarize the question that came in here just so I could, I could point that out so you would know that was the case. Uh, other questions. Um, this is, this is one, let's keep going. I've got uh, another couple ones in here. I'm sort of reading through as we're going and breaking down the details of this. Um, let's see. How this this is a good question. I think a number of folks talked about this when we were discussing vouchers, and, and it especially comes up with the A plus because obviously the A plus exam expects you to be able to take both exams. You have to take both exams and pass them to earn your A plus certification. You obviously don't have to do that for the network plus and security plus because it's only one exam. So the question here from Nick says. So I need to purchase a separate voucher code for both halves of the A-plus exam, correct? You are correct. That is exactly correct. Um, that is the case. So for each exam you take, you need a new voucher. For each exam sitting, you need to have a valid voucher. And once you use a voucher, it's gone. Now, there are some vouchers that CompTIA provides that have a retake option. Oh, you pay extra for it though. Kind of like insurance, but that's not that's not really helpful, uh, generally speaking. Uh, that type of insurance, probably a bad bet, but some people like to have that, I guess, flexibility. The problem though, is if you get a voucher with a retake and you pass it on the first time, 
the retake goes away. You can't use that retake to take a different exam. So you can't buy a 1001 retake and try to apply that to the 1002. That's not going to work for you. So I think it's important for people who are trying to get their certifications and trying to schedule them for your A+, you will need two separate A+, vouchers to be able to take the exam or pay for two separate exams. You could pay for the exam directly on the CompTIA website, but as I've already mentioned, why would you do that? Because you're paying full price. Uh, most people will get a discounted voucher somewhere, and the discount works pretty well. They can, they can work through that, and then you can purchase two separate vouchers. You'll notice on my site, when you're buying an A-plus voucher, I give you the option to buy one A-plus voucher by itself, but then you can also buy a bundle together and you save a few extra dollars when you buy both of the vouchers together because you have to have two vouchers eventually to take these two exams. Uh, some folks in the chat room, before we even got started with this, were talking about, do you take both of them on the same day? Do you take one? Do you stay for both and then take them one day apart? How does this work? And I think most people in the chat room kind of uh, gave the approach that I agree with, which is you study for one of the exams, you t go to take that exam, you pass that exam, then you can put that exam aside and move to the next one. The, there's no time frame or limitation of time between taking these exams. You could take one of the exams today, you could take the next exam two years from now. As long as you complete both of the exams before the entire exam series is retired. So let's talk about retirement and expiration, shall we? Let's, I'm going to go all the way to the top of my presentation. I'm sorry, I'm sort of gesticulating around here on the screen. So let's go to the very top of this presentation. I talked about this at the very beginning with the A+. But this is, this is an important consideration. I think it's one we should, we should talk about just a little bit. So here is the summary that we talked about earlier. So the A-plus exams are the 220-1101 and the 220-1102. You have to take both exams. You have to pass both exams. That's first number one rule. Once you pass both exams, you are A-plus certified. The moment you pass the second exam, you a three-year clock starts, and you are certified for three years. Right here at the bottom, it tells you your certification is good for three years after passing the exam. The exam series, which is the 1101-1102 together, that series retires, which means the last time you can take those two exams, we think is probably going to be around October of 2025. So all you need to do, you could take one of these exams today, it can be either one, and pass that exam. You have until October of 2025 to take the second exam and pass that one. And let's say October 25, 2025 shows up and you pass the second exam before the series is retired and you are A-plus certified. Yeah, but you're A-plus certified, but now the exam is retiring. Well, it doesn't matter. You pass the exams. Whatever happens to the exams at that point is irrelevant to you because you're A-plus certified. And the moment you pass that second exam, it's good for three years. So that's the difference between an exam retiring and your three-year certification expiring. I know they sound similar, and we sometimes use them uh, in interchangeably, but they are not interchangeable. So that's an important consideration. And especially if you're someone who is working on getting your A-plus certification, and you're wondering, uh, how quickly do I need to take these apart? There's no time frame, just as long as you take both of them by October of 2025, you're fine. And that's plenty of time from now. It's like two years from now. So we're fine. Uh, a lot of folks will tell you uh, online that they will step through and take these exams. Um, they'll start one, they'll take the exam, and then they won't take the next one for months. Six months afterwards, they take the second one. I've had people show up and take them years later, take that second exam, and finally earn their certification. Life is funny. It pulls us in different directions. Sometimes we're not expecting what's going to happen, and it might take a long time to roll back and start our studies again. Uh, but as long as you stay with it and you get both of them done, you're good. Now, what you don't want to do, here's the warning. So there's always a warning. So here's your warning. You don't want to take one of these exams and pass it and then not take the other by October 2025 and the exam series retires. If that happens, you have to start over again. So that's why that date is so important. Don't take one of them and pass 
and then for some reason neglect to take the second exam because you're left with nothing when this exam series retires. That's the important part. So that's your 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 scheduling and your consideration and your timing. It all revolves around that. So make sure you are familiar with the, the things you will need to run into. Uh, other questions. Uh, let's keep going down this list um, and figure out what the differences are um, and, and in this list. So the um, other ideas, this is a pretty good one. I talk about this and never really d dive into it. So I think we're going to discuss this one uh, from Penelope who says, that's not the right screen. How about this one? That's the right one. This one asks, how do I determine what I need to know about items on the objectives? This is a little bit of a challenge. This is the challenge that I have because I have to make videos for you that are training courses on these exam objectives. And the exam objectives is all I have. When they release the objectives, there are no books available yet. There are no other training courses available yet. All they hand me is the objectives. Let me see if I can pull up the objectives real quick. There they are. So all I have are the objectives. So I get this list. And as I'm going through the list, it starts at the top. Let's look at mobile devices, section one. Given a scenario, in, uh, install and configure laptop hardware and components. And it says hardware slash device replacement. And there is battery, keyboard slash keys, random access memory, hard disk drive, solid state drive, uh, migrations, uh, HDD, SSD replacements, wireless cards. Then there's another section for physical privacy and security components, including biometrics and near field scanner features. Okay, well, already we kind of get a feel for what they're asking for. They're saying, given a scenario, install and configure laptop hardware and components. But there's, there's a nuance to that, isn't there? They're not asking you to grab a screwdriver and take apart a system and replace one of these components and put it back together again during the exam. They, they don't have time for that. And that, that would be difficult to do in an industry certification exam. But they do give you a list of things that you should understand the process about. You should understand what's involved in replacing a battery, what's involved in replacing a keyboard, what's involved in replacing memory that's in one of these laptops. So that's what they're asking about. And there is a context to it that I guess in many ways I am fortunate enough to have gone through these exams so many times. Uh, we have exam series that we created for the 600 series, the 700, 800, 900, 1000, and now the 1100. So we have a good good uh, um, set of experiences over the years at understanding what these exams expect you to know. And so to, to really focus on that, if you want to know the scope and you want to understand exactly what CompTIA may be expecting of you, that's what I hope you have taken from my videos because that's how I made the video series, is I built the videos to give you exactly what CompTIA wants you to know. Hopefully, it doesn't give you less, and hopefully, really, it doesn't give you much more because I don't want to give you a lot of information that is pointless when you walk into the exam room. And now, the, the argument with that is, and the one that I've heard, is that, yes, but when you walk into your job, you need to know more things than what's on the exam. Absolutely true. I agree with you. That is that is true. You'll be doing this your entire career, trying to learn things that aren't in these exams. But the purpose for what we are doing here is for you to earn your A+. Plus. Put it in your pocket. Go get a job. That's what we're trying to do. Um, the The bulk of your IT career for the rest of your IT career, as long as that is, hopefully the, the rest of your professional life, you're going to be learning things. You're going to be constantly trying to keep track of what's going on. You're going to be constantly trying to keep up. You will always feel like you don't know enough. You will always feel that you're behind the curve. That's just the nature of IT. But that's normal. That's what we do. That's, that's why we're always learning. Because there's always new puzzles that we have to solve. There's always a new problem that we have to somehow figure out the Rubik's Cube that puts all the colors in the right place again. And unless we keep up to date with the latest operating systems, the latest technologies, the latest applications, the latest troubleshooting tools, all of those things, we're not going to be able 
to effectively solve these problems. So that's why I tell people all the time that you want to focus, focus, focus on the objectives and stay as close to the scope of what they're giving you on the page as possible. I realize sometimes that's not obvious. If you were to look at these objectives, there are certain objectives that may not give you a lot of detail. For example, this is a pretty good one. Here's a the, the really fits quite nicely. Compare and contrast protocols for wireless networking. 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, regulations for channels, the difference between 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz channels, Bluetooth, 802.11, A, B, G, N, A, C, and A, X. So already, just that one. So those five, that's all they give you. You know, compare and contrast protocols for A, B, G, N, A, C, and A, X. There, there's got to be more to it than that. And there is. And if you look at my videos, I give you a broad overview of differences and comparisons between those different versions because that's what CompTIA expects you to know. They don't really spell it out in the objectives. And I get that. So you, you sometimes have to read between the lines of the objectives to know what they're asking you for. But I will tell you, if you run into a situation where you're just not sure the context or you're not sure just how deep you need to go with these questions, have a look at my videos. I have structured the videos to match the expectations from CompTIA as close as I can. And if I, if I get any of them wrong or I need to modify, I update the videos. Very rarely does that happen these days. Uh, but what we really do in these live streams is we drill down on expectations. And a lot of people, as we were going through some of these videos, some of you felt, well, that question was really easy. Yes, because you studied that one and you know that one, but other people haven't yet. And hopefully once you get through all of the objectives, you now are comfortable. You now think all the questions are easy. That's where you should be striving for is that particular piece of it. I think the objectives are also a great place for you to study from. For example, here's a list of all the port numbers you need to know for the exam. And they list out all the protocols that are associated with those. But one way that you could study this is not just to say 20 and 21 are FTP, 22 is SSH, 23 is Telnet, 25 is SMTP, 53 is DNA. That's not going to help you. But what you really should be doing is saying uh, port 22 is secure shell. Secure shell is a way to uh, to use a terminal or console screen all, all remotely, and all of the traffic being sent across the network is encrypted. Next one. So it's more than just memorizing what's on the page. It's about understanding the context of what's on the page and use the objectives as a checklist. If you can explain each bullet to yourself or you can exchange, explain the bullet to your poor family member that has to put up with you studying for this exam, uh, and if they're still there at the end, that's, that's true love, by the way. Uh, they're the folks who you could explain this to. And once you explain it, you check it off the list. If you can't explain it well, you circle it and you can come back to it and study more until you can explain it to someone else. So that's, I think, one of the best uses of the exam objectives. And I think if you stick to that use, I think you'll be okay. That's really what we need to focus on. Um, other questions. Here's a good one that uh, I think I can address pretty quickly. Uh, this question says, Hey, uh, any news on the other slash new CompTIA course you're thinking of teaching? Nope. No news. Thanks for the question. Um, we don't. I don't have any news. There's the, you, the, the general rule is that these courses that I create take months to produce. It's not something you sit down on a weekend and you just, hey, there's a new course. There's a, an involved process uh, that goes through extensive amount of time. And so nothing exists until it's done in my world. And so for the perspective of what may or may not be arriving in the future, we will never know until it's finally here. So unfortunately, not only in this case, uh, not only am I not telling you, but I really don't have anything to tell you at the moment. But as soon as I do, you will know. I'll blast it out to social media and you'll talk about talk about it on the website and we'll have it in the live streams and all of that too. So absolutely, you will run into those situations. And I, I just don't have anything for you right now. I, I do appreciate the question though. And I, I like that you, you're asking and I like you're interested, but I just don't have anything for you. Uh, these things, the, the time... 
that is that is indeed the fire in which we burn. So I I am I am on fire. I am hot. Uh, but there's only so much heat available for all of this. So we'll have to see what what may be coming next or coming more or coming different. We just don't know yet. We'll figure it out. Uh, I do appreciate you asking, though, and it's a very good question. And you can keep asking. I just am not going to have an answer for you, I don't think, uh, and working through. More questions. Let's see. Um, this is a pretty good one because uh, I think it kind of focuses on what we have done. Let me get rid of some of these on the screen so we can archive that and we can archive this. Away it goes, away it goes. So this question uh, from William asks, I hear a lot of horror stories. You had one arm. Around the help desk positions for entry-level IT positions. There's a hook on the end. Are there other, other kinds of entry-level positions you are aware of slash recommend? There is certainly online, if you would like to read horror stories of people in their jobs, not just IT, there are plenty of horror stories to read through. And not every organization is as good or cares about their people the way that others do. But I will tell you, the vast majority of organizations that are big enough to have an IT help desk are organizations that take care of their people. I have, I have worked with and spoken with and dealt directly with literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies. I have been in to talk to their IT professionals. I have talked to their security teams, to their network management teams, to their help desk teams, to their uh, to almost every part of IT. And I've done that for over 24 years, for a long time. And I would say the vast majority of companies I go into are professional, are great places to work, are nice people, are not, um, are not on top of you to get things done as fast or in a, a certain way. Most of the time, if you are in a for-profit company, or a government organization, and you're in the help desk, usually your job role is to fix problems. They don't have a, a time associated with this. They're not pushing you to hurry, hurry, hurry. You got to get through more, 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 more. They're trying to solve the problem. You know, they're more interested in making sure that whoever's calling is able to get their problem fixed. That's what most organizations do. Now, there are others that are very different. I would say I, there's no specific one, but I would say generally speaking, and this is not true of all of them, but generally speaking, if you're working for a managed service provider, an MSP, which means that that organization is getting paid to provide support services for another organization, they are usually lean and fast. They want you to do things quickly, solve problems as fast as you can, because then you can solve other problems that are coming up. And the faster you do these, the, the more people are going to get done and the more money is going to come into the MSP. The, that is a little bit of more of a challenge because there's more pressure to get things done. The good side of this, however, is managed service providers, they work with every product in the world, it seems. They work with every technology made. <laughs> when you walk into an MSP, they're working with everything because they might have tens or even hundreds of customers, and every customer is a different grouping of things that they have to deal with. So you end up getting a lot more experience on an MSP, but it might be one of those fast-paced, slightly stressful uh, environments where you're learning a lot in a very short period of time. And I've worked for, not an MSP, I've worked for VARs, and I've worked for third parties that provide services to other companies, and it's all pretty much the same philosophy, which is get as much done as possible, as fast as possible. Quality is important, but, uh, you know, just get the job done, hurry up, that kind of thing. Uh, it, it can be stressful. It takes a certain kind of person to be able to deal with that and to compartmentalize it into its proper place. And that's you kind of struggle with that when you first start in the industry that there's a lot going on. There are these tight time frames. There is very few resources. And people are wanting to expect things from you. 
and that can be that can be a challenge that can be stressful and you have to learn how to deal with that stress for me it was scotch but for other people no it was it was scotch too. The, for me it was doing something outside of work there has to be a nice barrier a nice line you draw between your work life and your home life and we always talk about that balance but nobody ever really t really talks about how to get to that balance that that would be a whole nother course and how to make that happen. But I think that if you're someone who is getting into the industry, you need to already decide what those are. Now, that doesn't mean that if something emergent occurs and you need to be on site at midnight to install a new system, well, that's part of your job. Yes, you would grab what you need, go down there at midnight and fix the problem. There are jobs where that's an important part of that. I'm not saying you should call and go, sorry, I have a work-life balance. And I'm not able to go in at midnight right now and fix this problem. That's, that's not how it works. You, you need to focus on what your job is and get that part done. And I've done many overnights, and I've done lots of uh, early morning installs, and I've done lots of travel at crazy times of the day, and it was just sort of the job at the time. But what you're doing is you're learning and gathering info. There, I think everybody should have an awful job at some point. I really don't want anybody to have an awful job, but stay with me. Uh, I think everybody should have that job that pushes them, that drives them, that maybe there's just stuff that's not so great with the job, because I think that's what motivates you to get a better job. I think that's what motivates you to learn more, to learn faster, to uh, make more connections in the industry, to find a better place, and to be able to properly recognize the red flags at the next job. I have walked into many interviews where they've given me particular statements. There's things that I've seen as I've walked in. There's things uh, I often will ask during an interview, hey, could we do a tour of the data center? Can we do a tour of uh, do you have, if they have things in that building? Hey, can, I, can we get a tour? And they, people love to walk you around. Yes, here's the data center. And look at all of our data and all of our center in the data center. And they, they wander around. You can start, oh, there's the routers. There's the switches. Oh, there's a tape drive system. That's automated. It's very nice. Oh, here's a storage drives, big array they got over here. You can start picking out where things are. And sometimes you walk in the data center and there's cables everywhere. And this, is, that a, is that a spider? What is that? There's, there's stuff in the ceiling. What has happened there? There's like a server on its side. It's kind of hanging from the Ethernet cable. That's the only thing holding it up. And it's just sort of swinging there. We've all seen these, right? It's, it might even be in your house. I have one over here. I, I know what you mean. And it's just sort of sitting there. There's a hub back. You know, it's been sitting there for 20 years. There's something still plugged into it. And that's where you think, maybe this isn't the best place for me to hang out. Maybe I should go somewhere. They, they've still got this old equipment around. It's not installed properly. So you could pick some of those things out when you go to those interviews. And I think if you are trying to find the right job and the right entry-level position for some of those, you should be able to pick out which ones are good and perhaps which ones not as good. So I think if you stick with that, I think you'll be okay. Um, and I, I again, I'll have to stress, not all jobs at the help desk, not all jobs in IT are stressful, horrible stories that you read online. I'm fortunate enough in my career that the bulk of the jobs that I took were fantastic jobs working with great people. I learned a lot and had pretty good benefits, paid me very well, no complaints. Um, and, and even the last position I had where I was a systems engineer, next generation firewalls, we had security talks. I would go in and talk to security professionals. I'd go into some of the biggest companies in the world and sit down with their teams and talk about what they were trying to do and try to explain that I think I have something that might help them. And we could demonstrate it and play around with it and see weird things on the network. And here's something embarrassing. And, oh, look what that guy's looking at. And just amazing things that you, that you do in these meetings. Who wouldn't want to have a job like that? That's a, that is a blast. So you'll find the right place. It may take you going through those horrible jobs where you are just out in the field, digging through the weeds, uh, trying to get through the day. Uh, but eventually you're going to get to that job that has the, the features you like. It has the style you like. It has everything you want in a position like that. And I think that's, that's really the important part of it. Um, let's see, let's see other folks are saying, yeah, when the, the days since the last accident sign is blank, 
this might be a red flag for you. So you're absolutely correct. Daniel's spot on with that one. Uh, I never I never saw one of those. I have been to many organizations. Uh, somebody was talking about Spartanburg and uh, spent a lot of time at BMW plants. Uh, I've spent a lot of time at uh, um, Anheuser-Busch plants because we have a number of those in Florida. Uh, a lot of manufacturing plants. I've been to manufacturing uh, organizations that make garage doors. And you get to go on the manufacturing floor and see what they're doing with this technology. And here's what this is going to be solving for us. Um, those are interesting jobs to be in. I think that's that's another important part of this. I started my my first big IT job was at an insurance company, multi-billion dollar insurance company. They were a big company with lots of buildings and plenty of remote sites. I think they had 50 locations in the U.S. And um, it was a big company. And to this day, I'm not sure what we did. I, mean, I sort of know now what the scope was. But when I was working there, I really didn't understand what we did as a company. There was no assembly line. There was no, we didn't make widgets. There was no thing from, there was no, nothing I could touch other than the paper. We printed a lot of paper. There were a lot of printers and they printed a lot of stuff and we mailed a lot of things. And apparently that's what insurance companies make is mail to send to people. That's what they do because that is what they do. They, they make risk or they decide on risk. They charge for risk. That's an insurance company. Um, and so that's that's one that I think I learned a lot there for technology. Didn't learn so much for insurance. I think my next jobs after that, I shifted more towards the manufacturer side of software and hardware. So it may, may be the same for you. We'll have to see. Uh, let's do some more questions. How are we on time? Ooh, we're at the top of the hour. Let's squeeze in a couple more. I think we can get through a couple more. That was not Aflac. It was, in fact, the insurance company that I worked at was bought by a larger insurance company and no longer exists. It was John Alden Life Insurance in Miami, right there on uh, 826 in the airport. Those big black buildings, they're no longer John Alden buildings. Those big black buildings right next to Runway 9 right, uh, that's where I was working every day. What a great place to work, though. You'd be working on a printer on the fourth floor and a 747 just goes right by you. You know, right because you can look in the windows at that point because you're right at the point where they're coming down and you're you're at the same height as they are. Um, always kept wondering, can keep them on that side of the runway. Don't let them come left at all because these buildings are here. That was always my concern living there and working there uh, and driving by there. Just never know. But amazing, if you're into watching planes like I am, so great. Close to the jail. Jail was on 26th Street. This was, a, this was down on more like 25th. So they give you an idea. So a little bit past 25th, just a block or two south of 25th. I wish I could remember the address. That would probably help us. Oh, well. Um, although I think it was based on 72nd Avenue. So maybe that wouldn't have helped us at all. Other questions. Uh, we'll keep going down this list. Um, for these, um, <laughs> let's talk about this one. Uh, since, since you're asking about me and I'm talking about me, um, and gosh, I hate to talk about me, but we're going to talk about me some, uh, this question, uh, for Rasan asks, can you tell us about your own experiences as help desk? If you have ever worked as a help desk? Yes, absolutely. I can. Uh, there are probably two positions that I think I have had that qualify as a help desk position or entry level technology position. So my my very first technology job was working in college. So I don't know if you can call a job in college a job job because you you know you're not working towards a career at that job. You're working to get through college, at which point you're probably going to move away and, and take another job. However, I went to school at Florida State University and Florida State has and has continued to have a remarkable computing department. And I worked as a mainframe operator and supercomputer operator during my time in college. At the time, the supercomputer that was at Florida State was uh, one that was made by the Controlled Data Corporation. Just, to, just so you know how, controlled, how this turned out, controlled data is not around anymore. So they created a supercomputer called the ETA-10, and 
the ETA-10 was a liquid nitrogen-cooled supercomputer. Uh, the way it was described to me is that it had the power. This is this is back when dinosaurs roamed the Earth, so bear with me a moment. Uh, they described it as if everyone in the world called the supercomputer, it could process all of those calls twice in a second. I think that's how it was described to me back then. I don't know what the numbers are with that. It was just sort of a broad, this machine is fast sort of description of what we did. That was one where you kind of go in. I took the after hours, the evening hours. I would go in after class. I would just stay there and monitor the systems. I would take printouts off the printer. I would take plots off the plotter, and I'd put them out for people that were looking for their output. That was a relatively, it was sort of like a babysitting job for a big computer. So not really entry level, so to speak. It was a very niche job because not everybody has ETA 10 supercomputers sitting around. Uh, I could say, I know how to monitor the cryogenerator that refroze the liquid nitrogen and put it back through the cycle again. Well, great. Where am I going to use that again? Nope, that doesn't help me. That's a skill that I can only use in that room. It does sound cool on a resume. Daniel's correct. But it doesn't help. And it helps when you tell stories, but it doesn't help you get a job, so to speak. My first job out of college um, was when I moved to Miami. I was chasing a girl. She lived in Miami. I moved to Miami. Um, but fortunately, that worked out. I ended up marrying her, and now she's stuck with me forever. So that's that's her problem to deal with, not ours. The, the thing, though, in Miami, though, is I got a job working at a, uh, a computer company. A company that, not a computer company, a company that sold computers. <laughs> that's that's different than a computer company. I got a job in South Miami working for a company that sold computers. But it was the company that, that had the contract to, they were the exclusive provider of PCs for, at the time, Dade County. Now it's Miami-Dade County, isn't it? It's now Miami-Dade. But they had the exclusive contract. So they sold thousands and thousands and thousands of computers to Miami. And, of course, that contract also said, when we sell you a computer, you have the option to ask us to come set it up for you for free. So that was what, what we did. That's what I did. I was a field service technician. My job was to set up any computers that needed to be set up. I mean, this is literally you take it out of the box, you put the monitor on, you plug it all together, you go, have a nice day. Uh, but most of my job wasn't really set up. It was fixing things that weren't right with those because there was a, a year-long uh, warranty on these. So if something broke, we needed to do warranty repair. That was me. If somebody wanted to upgrade the memory in that system, they needed someone to come out and install the memory on site. That was me. If somebody wanted to upgrade their storage drive in that device, they needed someone to come out, swap the drives out, perform the the backup and the restore, that was me. So I was the field service person that covered Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties for this computing company. And it was it was kind of a tough job. You were driving around in your car a lot of the day. And if you've ever been in South Florida, not always the best roads. It's kind of busy sometimes. Yeah, I kind of have to know where the back roads are so you can kind of get around the problems on the turnpike or on 826 or, or on the Dolphin or wherever it happens to be. All of those problems, though, you, you figure out over time and you figure it out very quickly. And uh, I would just drive around all this South Florida every day going from place to place. I have my list at the beginning of the day. I'd go out and take care of the list. I'd stop back by the office and drop off my paperwork and I'd drive home. And that was me. And that, that lasted for nine months. And at the end of nine mo months, I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, and for those of you that have driven in Miami, you sort of understand nine months every day for nine months, you're driving in Miami. Yes, I was in South Miami. Now, what was interesting is uh, that pretty little girl that I was dating was working in South Miami Hospital. So she was literally across the street. Um, so it sort of worked out to some degree from a from a transport perspective. But but nurses have weird hours, too. So that wasn't a, a big plus. She eventually moved over to uh, Miami Beach for her nursing. Um, and so that didn't really work out either. But after nine months, I thought, I want to get a different job in IT. And I've already been to these big companies who have contracted with this computer company. 
And I stopped him one day. I said, I really like what you're doing here. I love the mood. I love the company layout. It was an insurance company. They had money. Uh, I like the style. Um, it, it, do you guys do hire people to do technical things? Because I got some. I got a little bit of skill from doing this for nine months. They get, they said yes, yes, we do. Give me your resume, and uh, I ended up getting a job there in their help desk. I leveled up to help desk. I my better job was the help desk job. So I went from less than help desk to help desk. So that was the second help desk position or entry level position I got. I sort of had two entry level jobs, one after the other. Uh, I ended up staying at that company for five years. I started in their service desk. That was their corporate name for the help desk. And it was really about taking phone calls from people uh, around the country who might have had a problem or in the building where I happened to be because we were in the headquarters building. And people would say, I'm having a problem printing. I'm having a problem loading this app. I'm having a problem with corrupted data. I'm having a problem pulling something off this drive. And I would need to either, at the time, there was not a lot of remote desktop to do. We would go to their desk. Like, hi, I'm James. I'm here to help you with the problem you had with the printer. Yeah, okay, what do we do? What's going on? And they would show me. I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Let's see what we can do. And then we would fix the problem. And then I would go back to my desk and wait for the next thing. That's pretty much help desk. A lot of them were on the phone too. We had uh, offices in uh, a big one in Dublin, Ohio, another big one in Sacramento, another big one in Boise. And occasionally I'd have to hop on one of those planes I saw flying by and go to one of those sites to do a big setup or do a big configuration. And that was fun too. So you sort of had a chance to really expand your knowledge uh, this company did have mainframes, albeit different type of mainframe than I had worked on in the past, but mainframe is effectively a mainframe. And so we had uh, new things to learn, new technologies, and I quickly moved out of that service desk and into server administration. Well, I started with workstation administration, loading windows, getting the desktop running, imaging the systems, then moved from there to server administration, monitoring uh, statistics, uh, uh, network throughput, uh, efficiencies, those on the server side to handle that. And from there, five years after starting there, I moved and started working as a systems engineer for Network General. So I learned enough about the network to have my own sniffers, deploy distributed sniffers all over the country. I was able to capture traffic everywhere, watch what's going on, optimize, solve problems, and I, I got so knowledgeable with that product that the company that made the product hired me. Now, that was a big change. That was an enormous change. I thought the insurance companies had money. Those manufacturers, they got some cash. So if it's a successful company, they got some money to spend on you. So I got an increase in pay. I got flexibility in my schedule. I had a lot of travel. I kind of The trade-off was now I have to travel places. I have to get on a plane and go somewhere because you're the one who knows stuff. You need to travel to the people that want to hear you say things about what you know. Um, and so we did that. So getting out of the help desk was sort of a, a incremental move that got me out and then learned more and then eventually set me on my path to be a systems engineer for the rest of my career. But I think if you're someone who's working on help desk, that's your time to be a sponge. If you get that first job in IT, Whatever they want you to do, you should do that because you're going to learn something from it. And even the things they don't tell you to do, you can always, you know, ask the network guys, hey, what, what are you doing over there? What's what you doing at Switch? What's what's going on? You installing something? Can I, can I watch? Can we see what's going on? Most people you work with in IT are so lovely and so interested in sharing what they're doing that I never had anybody push back. If I said, hey, I'll be glad to help. You need another pair of hands? Need somebody to help lift stuff? Need somebody to help set up? Do you have a thing you need to do? Can I come in on the weekend and watch what's going on? What's, I want to learn about that. And they were just more than, more than happy to do that. I think most places are relatively like that. If they see somebody who's interested in the technology and you're in, they, they're working on it, they go, yeah, you can look over this. Here's what we're doing. And they'll show you. Like, we do this and we're going to do this and here's the line. And then some of it I got, some of it I didn't. But it sort of goes into... If you don't understand immediately, it kind of goes into the back of your brain and then you're kind of think about it a little bit and then you see it somewhere else. You're like, oh, I know what that is. 
and you start putting pieces together. You know, throughout your career, you're just never going to be in that spot where you know everything about everything. And if you are in a position where you know everything about everything, you're in the wrong position. That's not IT. Uh, if you want to continue to move up and have more flexibility and make more money and do more things, you need to keep putting yourself in uncomfortable positions. So the more uncomfortable you are, the better you are. How does, how does that work? Well, I guess that's, I guess that's the story. That is, that is how that works. How long was I on the help desk? I was probably on that help desk. It all sort of blends together because it, it turned into more of this hybrid role. I was probably on the help desk for about a year. And then when these new product projects came up, like we wanted to deploy windows to everybody's workstation, if I may just for a moment, talk about how old I am. That's what I was tasked with doing. And they said, okay, you need to make this happen. What do we do? And so that effectively moved me out of a help desk role and more into a project-oriented role focusing on workstation administration. And so that was about, that was about a year um, and how that, that works. Um, that's, that, is, that is absolutely how those things usually go. If you're on a help desk for more than a year, you may not be positioning yourself to move up or out fast enough. And there are some people you will run into where you walk into a help desk. Um, this, is, this is George. He knows everything about everything. He's been here seven years on the help desk. He can help you. I think seven years. In the, but as it turns out, that was what he wanted to do. He didn't want a job doing something else. He didn't want that. Whatever that thing was above and beyond, he wasn't interested. And I got to tell you, that's the best possible position you can be in is when you're in a job that you really enjoy. And when they show up for me, they showed up with a management role. We'd like you to be the manager of the systems engineers. I thought, oh, this is a, this is a step up. Let's do this management role. And I stepped into a job in management and just hated it. Did not like it. Uh, it turns out they didn't like me doing it. It was a, it's a mutual type thing. I did it so poorly that they were happy to not have me be it anymore. And we're happy to tell me that. Um, and so they were able to move me back down to be a, a technical person again, at which point I realized being a manager is not an upgrade. Being a manager is not uh, being a, a more capable technician. It's being a completely different job. And I didn't want a completely different job. I liked the technical role. And in IT, you can make as much money as you like being technical. You can find the job with the flexibility you would like to have being technical. You can do whatever you want and still maintain that technical role if that's what you want to do. Now, I have worked with some amazing managers in my career. And I'm happy I wasn't being the manager, but I was super happy that they were because they were really good at it. And we should all find the things we're really good at and go do that thing. For me, it was the technical side. And I just stuck with that. I think it turned out okay, but I don't want to give people the impression that, and I think some people have the impression, you have to move into a management role. You have to be a VP of a thing. You have to be a senior director of the stuff. You don't. And, and it, may not, it may not be the role you want. Yeah, they might pay you more. Yes, there's more responsibility. There's probably more headache, but it's a different job. So the only thing that's that's technical about it is you're managing technical people. In fact, you're, once you become a manager, it's expected that you're not doing the technical job, nor should you be. You should be managing getting all the tasks done. Just didn't like it to have that there. So that wasn't my gig. Uh, I really tried to focus on what I, at that point going forward, I tried to focus on what I wanted to do. And I, that became kind of my watchword for what decisions I make next in my career. Is that something I want to do or not? And, and, and it took me a number of different places. Uh, it took me into technical marketing. It took me into uh, public speaking. It took me into a lot of different places I wasn't expecting, but that's where it took me. And then eventually brought me all the way back to being a systems engineer again, which ultimately was that comfortable shoe, was that that perfect fit for what I wanted to do. And that that worked good. But it all started with the help desk. It all started with that job on the help desk and making sure that I took care of these problems and solved the issues and worked in the field and moved up to the help desk and then just kept doing that. And I think uh, 
everybody has a different path, I think you'll find the right path for you as well. Let's do some more. Um, let's keep going. Other questions? Doo, doo, doo. Um, so this is, we're going to keep going down this list because I can fit, I can fit one more in. So I want to, I want to have a good one. Um, I think this is pretty good, pretty good one to have here. Um, cause this one sort of talks about vouchers and everybody's going to get a voucher or sign up for an exam at some point. You don't have to buy the vouchers from my site. Yes, you do, but you don't have to. Um, this question asks, are the vouchers good until the exam retires? And I would say the, vo the vouchers you get from CompTIA and the ones from my site are good for a year. That is the max that they're good for. And the rule with vouchers is you, this voucher is good for one year. And, oh, and now the, you can hear the beeping is going off. I'm going to have to kind of walk away from this for a moment and fix the beeping. I know what this is, but it is, uh, the fries are apparently up. Uh, let me let me go fix this, and then we're going to talk about vouchers. Hold on. Okay, I don't know if you heard the beeping or not, but I did, so we had to fix that. So, the um, vouchers are good for a year. The rule with vouchers is there's always an expiration date on the voucher. It's almost often 12 months. You could purchase a voucher from a third party that is less than a year. Some third parties have vouchers for whatever reason that might be good for three months or they might be good for six months or they might be good for one month. And then you have to, to get it, everything done in that one month. That's very uncommon, um, but most vouchers are good for a year. The rule from CompTIA is that you have to not only schedule your exam with that voucher before that voucher expires, but you have to complete the exam before the voucher expires. So you can't, you can't play the game where you buy it and you're coming up on a year and then you book your exam and you keep pushing your exam out another month doesn't work that way. You have to both, com you have to buy the voucher and complete, you have to take the exam before the voucher date of expiration. That's the hook. That's the, that's the catch. So you have to think about the timing. That's why I always tell people, and some people do it this differently. I have people that will come to my site and they will, they will ask, uh, or they'll, they'll buy a voucher when they start their studies. And then something happens in the world uh, that they're in, you know, chaos intervenes, and they're not able to take their exam when they want it. And it gets pushed down the road. And it gets pushed down the road again. It gets pushed down the road again. And then they come up on the expiration date and think, oh, I've got to take this exam. And they think that they'll be able to book the exam, but then change the date to be a month or two out. And you can't do that. And what I really tell people what they should be doing is not buying the voucher until just before they're ready to take the exam because that's when the clock starts once you buy the voucher and then you've got a year but you're about to take the exam anyway you should be buying the voucher and effectively using the voucher immediately i think that's probably the best way to approach this i don't think buying the voucher earlier in in your studies is really the most advantageous strategy when there's an expiration date involved so hopefully that will that will give you a perspective of this. And uh, since since it came up, uh, folks in the chat, since I got up out of my chair, and folks, let's get up out of our chair again. The question from Brian in the chat room: What kind of chair is that? Uh, uh, what is that? What is that chair you got there? This chair. What a fine chair! What a fine chair this is. Um, this is a. This is a, a low-end, uh, currently unavailable, hasn't been produced in forever chair that I got from Office Depot or somewhere. It is a very uh, inexpensive chair, but it's, it's, this, it's a mesh chair, sort of like the mesh that you'd see. It has the same similar style. It's probably kind of a knockoff of the, of the uh, Herman Miller 
style chair that's all all mesh and doesn't have padding on it. And that's probably why it's lasted long because it's a mesh style chair. Um, but it's 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 seen its better days for sure. But it just keeps working. Any moment now, I'm expecting to lose the hydraulic piece on the bottom, and I'll slowly start just going down lower and lower. Like you'll start to see me shrink on here, and I get so I, I expect that's going to happen eventually, and I dread this day uh, because then I will have to buy another chair. And if you've ever tried to shop for a, a desk chair, a good one, because I'm in this chair all day, every day, you know, this is first, it's expensive. And there's only if you look at the industry, there's 100 million chairs that you have to look at. There's there's a bunch of chairs. And it's not an easy it's sort of like asking someone to go out. Could you go out and get me a chair? Can't do that. No, this is a very personal thing. That's like saying, could you go out and get me some luggage? No, hold, hold on. Could you go out and get me a laptop bag? Wait a second. Can't just do that. You have, you have to figure it out. You have to get the laptop bag for you. You have to get the luggage for you. And you have to get the chair for you. So, so far, knock on something, it's, it's been great. This chair's worked out fine. Uh, I don't want it to change anytime soon. But I have a feeling it, it will be eventually. Uh, I can't get it anymore. I haven't been able to find it online. It's not anywhere. And quite honestly, I could probably use a better chair uh, eventually anyway. Uh, probably a good idea. But that's that's sort of an aside and sort of the way this this is all working through here is with that chair. And it works. As long as it's working, I'm just going to keep using it for now. Uh, but I think it's going to uh, um, it's going to be a problem. Okay. Okay. Um, other questions, other questions, other questions. Um, I, I will do one more. I think I, I talked about only doing one more. Well, we're going to do another one. Um, and I think this is a common thing that people bring up, so I think it's worth talking about. Uh, this is a question from uh, uh, The Anonymous. Hello, Anonymous. It says, I've been reading the Cybex 1101-1102 study book. Uh, it's a, re it, by the way, which... This is an aside. It is a quite a good book. Um, Anonymous writes, it's a really intimidating book, being almost 1,800 pages. You are correct. What are your opinions on the uh, efficacy of these massive books and their apparent strategy of just throwing all the details at you? I feel my brain is melted after a 30-minute slash hour session with these books. So the... These books are actually quite good. Cybex is a fine book. Every book has their different uh, style and different voice. I really tell people that you need a book. You need to get a book because books have a way to teach you information that's different than the way a video can teach you information. And the hands-on labs teach you a different way than a book or a video. And the practice exams teach you a fourth way. So you really need these books. They go into a lot of detail, but the exam does go into a lot of detail. However, one thing that seems to be common for many of these books, not all, but many, is that they tend to go outside the scope of the exam quite a bit. And I think, Anonymous, you've sort of hit on this, is that it's 1,800 pages, um, and they just talk on and on. They talk about things that are not in the exam objectives. They give enormous lists of things that aren't listed anywhere in the exam objectives. And it seems like when you're reading the book that you've got to memorize this. But then when you look at the objectives, you realize, no, none of this is on the exam. So you have to find the right book. I like the CompTIA books. Well, I also know the author of the CompTIA books. We go back a number of years in this industry of with A+. And a lot of the people that write the A-plus books and what they've done come from other organizations where we've worked together before. But they stick so close to the objectives in the CompTIA books. They really stay tight to those objectives in the CompTIA books. That's why the CompTIA books are on my site, because I like them. There are some other books out there that do a similar thing. So I think that would be a good way for you to kind of get into the details of some of these topics and kind of understand them from the inside out. Now, granted, some of these books like to give you more context so that you can understand the other topics a little better. But then you're getting into that place where how much extra do you need to know when you're what you're really trying to do is pass this exam. 
And there, there's a fine argument to be made that there's value to that. There's also a good argument to be made that it's a waste of time. So you have to figure out the balance for you and the books that you're using and how they work. I would highly recommend if you're looking for a good book, go out to Amazon. Go read through the books that are there. They let you read a couple chapters, right? You can look inside and see what that book is about. Go grab the top four or five on Amazon and read those chapters. Which ones felt good to you? Which ones spoke to you better than others? Which ones had a better style that matches your style? Because every book is a little bit different. And I think if you're going to focus on finding the right book and doing the right piece, having the right piece of information at a glance at your fingertips, you need to have a good book. It is going to help you. Um, not everybody uses a book. Some people have told me I go to Professor Messer, I watch the videos, I go take the exam. I, I think that's great that it works out for that person. But I think for most people, you need a good book. And I think finding a good book can, can be a difference between getting the content and really understanding the content. Um, so it's a little bit of everything. There's never any one thing. It's always a mixture of different things. You put them all together. Your brain grabs the parts that are important that it understands the best and it sticks them in there. And I think that's probably one of the best ways to go about doing this. I think uh, uh, always have another set of references that can really help solidify the details of what you've seen other places. And I think that would be good too. Well, I think that's probably a good place to stop. I've kind of gone over time on this one. I apologize. But but uh, I appreciate you hanging in there with me. Thanks for all of your questions. Thanks for your comments. Thanks for thanks for just being here. These would be very boring without having you here to answer these questions for me. And it's always a lot of fun. And I love doing them. Uh, we're doing another one of these two days from now on Thursday. Come back for our core two A plus study group on Thursday. Same time, same process. Same front end, same everything, except it's all topics and brand new questions that come from the core to exam. In the meantime, we're over on our Discord. We'd love to have you join us there. We're at professormesser.com slash Discord. And if you like this video, it would make my day if you could just give it a thumbs up. If you subscribe to the channel, I'd be over the moon. It'd be fantastic. I appreciate you being here. Thanks for joining us. We will see you next time on the A Plus Study Group. Thanks, everybody.